Welcome everybody um, to the 10th annual second virtual student-led interprofessional poster session. I'm really so excited to see you here. I know that's not in the script, but welcome, welcome, welcome. We've made it through another really challenging year. And once again, you, the students have wowed us with your commitment uh, to collaboration and teamwork. And I'm gonna hand it over to Chris now to describe what it is we're actually doing today, Chris. Thanks, Shelly, and welcome everyone. Today we have presentations from 17 teams made up of over 80 students from 15 different health professions. Uh, all of this work reflects the difficulties of this year. We have a focus in one of the breakout rooms on telecollaboration. We have examples of transformative leadership. Everyone has had to lead in new and different ways this year. We did enroll uh, 10 teams in the interprofessional team immersion, and that included students and faculty from Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago as well. And despite the challenges for the, that were present in this year, many students were able to complete research as well. Shelley? Sure, thanks. So we're really delighted that President Herbert and Interim Provost Karen Pardew have brought us their thoughts and messages today. So hello everyone and welcome to this really exciting event. I want to thank the Center for Excellence in Collaborative Education for inviting me here today just to say a few words and to congratulate our students on all your incredibly hard work. Um, the posters that you're going to see today are the culmination of the students' work over the course of their time at UNE. And many of you are gonna receive interprofessional honors distinction upon graduation, which itself is an impressive achievement. But the, the work that you're gonna do speaks for itself. The quality of the work is, is incredible. And I'm just so very, very proud of you. And more importantly than any of that, perhaps is the relationships that you've built in doing this work. Many of those relationships are gonna stick with you and, and gonna be with you for the rest of your lives. And I'm sure you'll appreciate that more and more over time. Interprofessional education, or IPE, replicates what you're going to find in the real world when you're in practice settings, where you're going to be forced to collaborate and work with colleagues across disciplines. So it's part of the real world, but at UNE, we start training our students early on in IPE so that they have the skills not just to participate in this space, but to lead in the space. And so we really are training you with the kinds of leadership skills that you're going to be able to, it's going to set you apart vis-a-vis -vis your peers when you get out in the, in the workspace. It does pay off. I could go on and on about the statistics and the data on IPE and how it improves patient satisfaction, patient outcomes, it reduces provider burnout, it reduces medical errors, and there's, there's great data on all of that. But I think what's perhaps more poignant and impressive are the stories that students tell us. And I'd like to quote one of our alums who recently sent a quote um, expressing their experience. This person said, opportunities at UNE made more of a difference than I realized. My colleagues from other institutions envied my experience. It set me apart. And I think that says it all. So congratulations to all of the students participating in today's poster session for their hard work. And I also wanna give a special shout out to the faculty, the professional staff, and the advanced year students who supported our students um, along the way to, to today's achievement. So congratulations to you all and thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Karen Pardue. I'm the interim provost at the University of New England, and I am so pleased to welcome you to the Center of Excellence in Collaborative Education annual poster session. Today, we gather to celebrate students and faculty who have participated this past year in interprofessional projects, programs, clinical experiences, and research studies. Collaborative team-based approaches to healthcare delivery are a signature pedagogy here at the University of New England. We understand that patients and communities realize the best possible outcomes when delivered in a person-centered, respectful, team-oriented manner. No one discipline can tackle the challenges and opportunities inherent in healthcare. Instead, this complexity requires that all of us gather and listen, learn, and respond together in a well-coordinated way 
to achieve the best possible outcomes for our patients, their families, and our communities. I am excited to learn this afternoon from the presentations, and I congratulate all of the students, the faculty, and participating community partners who have been involved this year in this important work. Thank you to President Herbert and Interim Provost Pardue, and many thanks to all the faculty mentors, student facilitators, and CC graduate assistants, and most importantly, the students who have made the extracurricular effort to travel virtually with us for a while this year and learn about from and with each other along the way. You've all done a very difficult thing very, very well, uh, we think. Uh, we'd now like to present the 2021 M. Lisa Pagnuco Interprofessional Faculty Award. Shelley? All right, I'm going to do this without crying, I promise. It is my distinct honor to present this award that we give every year to a unique faculty member for outstanding achievement in interprofessional service. We are delighted to announce that this year's awardee, like Dr. Pagnuco, is from our School of Pharmacy. Dr. Emily Dornblazer. As accreditation standards for interprofessional education in pharmacy became, to say the least, more robust, <laughs> um, Dr. Dornblazer, without hesitation, took on the task of integrating pharmacy students into UNE's interprofessional culture through shared classes, simulations, and new in interprofessional honor mic micro credentials. Dr. Dornblazer has earned her place as in UNE uh, Interprofessional Champion. And Emily, congratulations to you. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. That's wonderful. <laughs> These are awesome. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you all so much. It's an honor um, to be recognized by by all of you and all of the work that, that you all do. Um, I really appreciate it. And I just wanna thank all of the students for always bringing enthusiasm and willingness to learn and respect for everyone to all of these experiences. Um, you know, we, we set the stage, but I think you guys are really the actors that make this, this happen. And so um, it's just an honor to always, to work with you all. And, you know, we are learning from, with and about, and I always learn from the students just as much as I hope you all learn. So I really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Em. Excellent. Well, that's, uh, we'd love to start with a celebration and now we're going to get uh, into, the, into the nitty gritty a little bit and give you some instructions about how to take advantage of what's happening today. So, as you can see, the poster session will occur in four breakout rooms running simultaneously. So you'll have research, telecollaboration, leadership, and the team immersion breakout rooms. And in your brochure, you'll see the highlighted in yellow events that are connected with the line. And that indicates that you're on the live stream. So the live stream will start in research, move to telecollaboration, uh, back to research, and then over to leadership for the pandemic plan um, presentation, and then to team immersion with the client-centered chameleons. Uh, obviously, everyone has the chance to do their presentation, to play the video of their presentation in their breakout room, and then there should be five or six minutes for conversation in between. You can see on the left side of the screen that uh, the timestamps are... Um, Keep, it keeps things moving quickly and it's important for us to stay on time because we would love to have you join us for the last five minutes. We're going to be recognizing a few of the really outstanding presentations from today. And if you get lost or confused or don't know how to move from room to room, just stay in the main room and um, Lee, Cody from uh, communications and I will help to manage, um, manage you moving into your breakout rooms. And so Lee, if the breakout rooms are open, I think uh, people can start to move and go to the track that most interests you. Hi, my name is Mike Govin and I'm from Team Space. 
With me today is Lyric Jordan, Talia Coat, and Julie Shea. The aim of this project is to determine what methods were most effective in connecting with our patient during our telehealth visit. Telehealth is an emerging service that is being utilized now more than ever as it is being used to reduce the spread of coronavirus. Although telehealth increases access to health care for some, others may not have access to devices capable of virtual communication or may not be comfortable using such devices. It is unknown if health outcomes are better or worse with the implementation of telehealth, so we hope this experience will shed some light on how it can be used appropriately in today's world. In order to complete this pilot study, we surveyed IPTI Team 2 members consisting of four girls and two boys through an anonymous survey platform. Participants were asked to recall their IPTI telehealth sessions and answer questions on what methods they used to establish a connection with the patient and which method, if any, they felt was effective. The survey revealed that the top three most utilized methods by Team 2 were positive reinforcement and words of encouragement, humor, and involving other team members in the conversation. However, the majority of the group reported that talking about the patient's personal interest was the most effective way to establish a connection with them. Telemedicine has become a vital part of patient access and communication, but it also has its challenges. Team Space found that connecting with patients was significantly harder than in-person encounters. The team found it critical to connect with the patient on a personal level in order to establish a relationship. Once the patient felt comfortable with the providers, he was able to open up about his goals and medical concerns. The encounter also emphasized the importance of time. By being able to interact virtually, it gave the patient access, which would not have taken place otherwise. We learned that in order to do our jobs as medical providers, we have to treat the person as a whole and learn who they are before addressing their medical concerns. So in conclusion, our team really saw that humor, shared interests, a strengths-based approach, and an interdisciplinary collaboration really had the highest impact on building a positive rapport during our simulated telehealth experience. And for future studies, it would be really helpful to have a larger sample size to really see what factors contribute to this positive report on telehealth, especially as they increase. So we really want to thank um, interprofessional team immersion for giving us this opportunity to work on a team. And also, we really want to thank our faculty mentors, Dr. Cramsey and Dr. Albina. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments. So team two, um, great job on your presentation. I am curious if any of your team members are willing to share kind of, um, it sounds like there were some challenges just making those connections um, as well as some things that you anticipate bringing into your future practice. Um, so if you don't mind just kind of recapping sort of what the challenges were and what you think mitigated those and how you'll use it in the future. I wasn't sure if my volume was off because it was quiet and I'm like, is my volume working? Um, so I think that one of the biggest takeaways, which, which we said was just the importance of establishing a connection. And I know for me, as someone who wants to go into pediatrics, telehealth has been a major uprising thing because you don't have to bring a patient into the chair to have these desensitization appointments. So I feel like not only did I practice the ways to establish a connection over telehealth, but also it just reconfirmed the importance of getting to know your patient on a more personal level and not necessarily just on a medical level. That's something that I will definitely carry forward um, with the rest of my career, um, whether that's with adults, pediatrics, geriatrics, um, I think it's very beneficial. And I really hope that groups in the future that do um, team immersion look at this and think um, maybe they could take this sort of pilot study and grow it and be able to pull more than just their specific IBTI group. I think that would also be really helpful. Yeah, I think going off of that, um, in the beginning, it was kind of, I think, uncomfortable for us because it might have been one of our first telehealth experiences or um, just like working on an interprofessional team. And I felt like 
like not being in person, it was hard to kind of like try to gauge eye contact and body language, especially based off of like where the vid or where the camera was for our, our patient. Um, so it really did help us just kind of like use that humor and like use our, our shared interest to kind of get the ball rolling and kind of like break this almost like too professional of a of a medical team just to kind of be like we are humans too like we want to get to know you and we also like want to be able to help you i'll ask a question were there any surprises or unexpected outcomes in this something just really took you you know you weren't expecting i think the what wasn't surprising not to flip your question was the results of what everyone found to be most effective however when we surveyed our group in the most utilized methods um establishing that personal connection with them actually wasn't one of the highest results. Uh, so that was definitely surprising because the methods we were utilizing and thought that would be important, um, like asking about their medical history and things like that, weren't what showed up in the results. So that was a little bit contradicting, but it was a pleasant surprise, I think. I think um, to answer uh, Dr. Cramsey's question, just being able to I think we, somebody, or I think it was Talia who asked him like, oh, what, do you, what is your, like, what's your hobby? And he kind of said guitar. And I feel like it just kind of like turned into like, oh, like that's awesome. And we just started rolling with like, um, like where the guitar stores and stuff like that were. And like things just kind of got really so much more comfortable after that question. And it was just such a simple question, but it was so helpful to like make a good connection. Yeah, I think really it, how it showed how important it was to read body language, even through telehealth, because he was a very monotone um, patient. And when we brought up the guitar, his body language, you know, opened up. And I think being able to read that and saying, oh, I think he wants to talk more about that. And taking that idea and running with it was essential for us to be able to actually provide good recommendations um, for his mental health and his total well-being because we were able to tie the interest of guitar into his job search and other things like that, which was really helpful. And just to get the ball, room, ball moving, you can move to different breakout rooms if you want, but I'll be putting up a new transition slide. And the next one starts at 1220. Hello, my name is Brandon Thompson be joined by my colleague Aaron Walsh as we discuss and share our poster presentation with you all. Special thanks to Dr. Thomas Mauser who served as the principal faculty investigator of the present study. The title of the study is Self-Reported Cognitive Decline, Differentiating the Worried Well from the True Cases. Understanding the differences between normal age-related changes in memory and thinking versus cognitive change that might be associated with diseases such as Alzheimer's or dementia is important, especially in an era of continual medical advancement that has resulted in an increase of our elderly population. Cognition changes in normal aging adults typically results in slower, less accurate decision making or processing external stimuli at a slower rate. Age related diseases such as Alzheimer's accelerates the decline in neuronal functioning and consequently cognitive decline, which has a detrimental impact on the individual's ability to perform activities of daily living. Participants of the study were selected by the study coordinator and the director for the Center for Excellence in Aging and Health. Study research teams are made up of a variety of health professionals, including social workers, pharmacists, and occupation therapists. Phase one protocol involved a short interview with the participants that assessed their reason for participating, their hearing and vision, daily life, health, and cognition. This was followed by the testing portion of the interview, which involved six cognitive tests. Pictures of these tests are shown here on our poster. Data was then collected and analyzed to determine if participants would be categorized as true cases or word wells. We utilized these preliminary results to select certain participants to complete a phase two interview process. We plan to analyze this data as a whole and will leverage our findings to not only assist those who are true cases to find a path to proper treatment, but to advance our knowledge of normal cognitive aging and other changes associated with true cognitive diseases. Thank you. 
Thanks for that overview of our study in phase one, Brandon. I'm gonna take over from here to discuss phase two and some preliminary outcomes. After phase one was completed, participant scores were analyzed. 72.5% of the participants fell into the worried bell category, whereas 15% were considered likely true cases and 12.5% possible true cases. A subset of 20 participants were chosen for a phase two follow-up interview. The aim of phase two was to further understand the participants' activities, health, and wellness in the context of their daily lives. Finalized results from phase one and two are expected to be released this summer and will answer questions like, do persons identified as a true case differ from persons identified as a worried well in terms of health conditions? Our hypothesis is that true cases will have evidently more health conditions than worried well and that the types of health conditions will differ between the two as well. We expect the true cases to present with more CNS and heart-related conditions than the worried well. Thank you all for listening to our brief synopsis of our ongoing study. We welcome any questions you may have during our breakout session. All right. Thank you for listening, everybody. We'll take your questions. And I'll, I'll post the poster in the chat as well if you guys want to take a look. So nicely done, folks. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and pitch a question. So as you got to know these people during the interview, you may have developed kind of a a sense for them, and then you tested them and learned actually how they performed. And I'm wondering um, if you experienced um, any disconnects between how the person presented to you and then what you actually experienced with their testing in terms of maybe those that struggled and didn't do as well. I'm curious if you have any reflections on the clinical experience of assessing someone in, uh, suspected of having cognitive impairment. Um, yeah, I can start with that one, uh, Dr. Mieser. That was a really great question. I think it really kind of depended on where we were in the interview with the patient specifically and kind of if you guys were in the um, breakout room for the first um, presentation, I think it kind of associates with that. If we're, if we're talking to a patient who might be kind of closer to the side of a true case, but we were talking to them about something that they're interested in, they seem to be a lot more engaged and involved in the questions um, regarding that. But if it was something, you know, <clears throat> more about their health um, and how they're feeling about it, you, we, we, for me personally, I, I think I started to notice a little bit more of a, a disengagement in the patient. Um, whereas with the worried wells who didn't really have any true dementia symptoms going on, regardless of what type of question was being asked, um, they seemed to be pretty consistently engaged in the interview process throughout. I'll keep the conversation going, hopefully. Uh, so as an OT faculty member, I'm just curious what it was like uh, to um, give six different assessments to the individuals and if you had familiarity with those tools prior to this project, what it was like to learn them and then to implement them. Yeah, I'll take this one. Uh, for me, I've never had experience uh, administering a cognitive uh, test before. So um, the process was definitely new for me, um, but I thought it was a very um, enlightening experience. Um, I enjoyed my time working with a, I worked with a social worker, um, which is great. And uh, in terms of administering the test, it took some practice. So we had some practice sessions to make sure what we're doing was correct. And uh, once we got rolling, like the first couple were a little, little uh, difficult, but once we found um, like our groove, we, we could just do it pretty easily. And it was very, very seamless working together with my partner. So overall, it was a really great experience. Yeah, if I could just kind of, oh, go right ahead, Dr. Don Blazer. I was just gonna follow up on if you could talk a little bit about how having this be an interprofessional experience maybe impacted the, the learning that you guys had. I was actually that my response is going to go right there. I was going to um, say, you know, as as pharmacy students like Brandon and I are, you know, initiating these cognitive tests is something we we aren't trained in. We're you know we're we're the medicine people. We do a lot of these um, point of care testing things like that. Nothing super cognitive. So to take these extra um, Zoom meetings to to learn these um, cognitive tests and stuff, it really gave me more of appreciation to our occupational therapists and our other um, interprofessional team members to it really gives you more of an insight as a pharmacist to potentially what medications they may need, may not need just based on these cognitive tests. So it's 
it really just opened my eyes more to really how important um, an interprofessional team is to treat a patient to the best of our ability. And from an OT perspective, to hear that, like, what my results from, like, these cognitive screens would, like, like change the medication that you're going to give, that's interesting as well. Like, I know, a little tangential, but... Thank you, everyone. I'll be, um, this is your time to stay here or go into a breakout room. That was an awesome presentation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, guys. Hello, and thank you for joining us. We are pleased to present our poster on medications and cognitive aging and community dwelling older adults. My name is Emily Poirier, and I'm a third year pharmacy student. And my name is Carly McKenna, and I'm a second year master in social work student. Carly and I participated in a study of cognitive aging led by Dr. Muser as an assessment team. Our role was to meet with community dwelling older individuals via Zoom and administer a testing protocol. I was interested in the relationship between the presence of potentially inappropriate medications in older adults as identified by the beers list and cognitive patterns. Our purpose was to identify if there's an association between the use of beers list medications and associated factors and indicators of cognitive impairment in community dwelling older adults who report subjective memory complaints. The data that we collected from each of the participants was analyzed using correlation and mean difference statistics. We expected to see a relationship between participants taking beersless medications and worsened cognitive testing scores. However, no obvious relationship was identified. We did find one correlation between anticholinergic burden score, which is the sum of all anticholinergic medications and the short blessed test. Our analysis also indicated a correlation between polypharmacy, which is the use of multiple medications and possible cases of cognitive impairment. We have examined one of our participants um, with the possible cognitive impairment more closely. This is Jane Johnson, and she is an 81-year-old Caucasian female. Please refer to our poster for more of a social history on Jane. And Jane reports the following health conditions, hypertension, arthritis, history of smoking, and suffers from poor sleep. She has prescribed the following medications to treat her health conditions, metoprolol, lisoprol, and HCTC, she also reports taking over-the-counter Benadryl. In January 2021, Jane participated in the following. She reported a worsening of her memory and thinking, particularly with remembering names, and she reports no family history or memory difficulties or cognitive changing or decline. Jane was given numerous cognitive tests over Zoom, and she took the SAGE and scored a 16. The score of 16 on the SAGE is consistent with mild cognitive impairment. And as previously mentioned, Jane takes Benadryl, which is identified as a highly anticholergic medication by the beers list and can contribute to cognitive impairment, confusion, or sedation. While we did not find the results or get the results that we expected, this was just a small sample study um, that was good for first step and provided a lot of pilot data for a larger research study that Dr. Muser plans to pursue. Thank you for sharing. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? I guess I have one. Um, Dr. Muser, for your like future research, like is there anything from the study that you're going to change about that or just kind of think about a little bit more based off of these findings? Sure, thanks for asking, Julie. So we all hear these warnings with medications. Um, it might affect your driving or don't operate heavy machinery or whatnot. And we, we generally think about certain medications as not being appropriate for older adults. And I dropped a copy of the beers list link into the uh, chat for those that want to look it up. It's actually good for all health professionals to know something about beers list drugs. Um, our sample size was too small probably to see much of a signal, although in the case that Carly read, we definitely had a recommendation, time to stop Benadryl for this one person probably. Uh, at least it's something that she needs to take back to her primary care doctor. Uh, the hope is that we can get a grant to do a much larger uh, community uh, sample where we can both test people and learn about their medications and, and uh, see a signal for, for drug impacts in the future. And I'll ask a question of, of Carly, just, you know, so you, um, as a social worker working um, in an interprofessional team, you evaluated um, 
these um, participants. What was it like working with somebody from a pharmacy perspective in this? And did you learn something new about that that you didn't know before? I give all pharmacy students a lot of respect for pronouncing any of the medications. Um, Emily was really kind and generous with how many recordings that we did for me to even come close to it. Um, but just from a medical perspective, um, it was really fascinating to see, you know, what Emily picked up on during the interviews versus what I would pick up on um, in terms of, you know, mental health and social setting and um, people like relationships, whereas Emily was more focused on, um, you know, the medications and how they're working together and how they could be affecting her cognitive change. So um, I did learn a lot. Yeah, terrific, thank you. Any, any last questions for Carly or I? Since there's time, I'll mention that Emmy, Emily Poirier wanted to be with us, but she's traveling to see her family today and couldn't participate. Uh, my name is Faye. I'm a social work student. I'm Corey. I'm an occupational therapy student. My name is Christine. I'm also a social work student. And we're going to- For our project, we created a body map. So here it is. Um, so a body map is an arts-based social work intervention. It's used with a number of populations from LGBTQ youth um, to sex workers to immigrant communities. Um, what you do is you'll start with the outline of your body and the inside is going to represent your values, um, what's important to you. The outside is going to represent your supports, um, who and what are, um, are important to you and, and support you. Um, so we decided to um, do, one, do it for each of our fields and we'll have Corey start with the occupational therapy. So on the left there, I'll start with my in the inside of my outline. I do have a tree that represents family. Um, I've always grown up around animals. I enjoy traveling and hiking. And on the outside on the left, I have AOTA, which is our governing body, which is the American Occupational Therapy Association. I have some popular models that we use. I have also different technologies that we might use in practice and also different drawings representing everyday occupation activities that we may do with clients. And on the bottom there, I have the Just Right Challenge, which is something that we strive to do with each client. So for the social work side, Faye and I did ours together. So our inner body represents, um, you know, the things that helped us get to our social work career. So we both like to help people, um, as well as we have interests in being outdoors and spend time with our, our pets and family. Um, and on the right hand side, on our outer body, we have the things that we care about in our fields, which is social justice and policy issues. And on the bottom, it shows the theories that we use. We do micro, meso, and macro work. We do work with motivational interviewing and poly polyvagal, and we also create safety plans. And on the, um, this area here that is um, in between us, we um, represented the aspects of our field that overlap. So um, we do mental health work, um, CBT work, communication is very important, client-centered care. We work with families. Um, we work with evidence-based practices. Ethics is important and um, mindfulness is important for both of our fields. And up here, um, we work in a lot of different um, settings. And that was our project and thank you. That's our time. Um, you kind of talked about, I think it was one of the social workers, you kind of talked about how it's done in practice. Um, is there like typically like a age range or is it more like a type of situation that the client is that you would use this the most or is it just? Use body mapping. Mm -hmm. um, it's been used with, with youth, um, but also adult populations. Um, there was um, I think indigenous women in Canada, there was a body mapping um, thing that went for like a, a couple of days um, and each woman made their own map. So um, so yeah, really any, any age. Was there anything that surprised you? Sorry. 
cut you off. But was there anything that surprised the group about like what each person put in the middle or, or like anything? Yeah, I think that we were surprised that we had so many similarities between our fields, kind of seeing, you know, the things we're like, oh yeah, we do this. And like, do you also talk about this? Or, you know, and some of them are pretty obvious, like client-centered work and, you know, but evidence-based practice also, you know, and mindfulness and, and, you know, obviously we all work with family systems. So it was just a lot of similarities that we didn't really think about or realize until we started doing this project. Thank you guys for a great presentation. It sounds like you gained a lot of positive outcomes as students learning about and appreciating each other's professions. I'm wondering in practice, what are some of the positive outcomes that result from body mapping interventions? Um, it can be a useful, you know, arts-based um, social work can be really useful for, um, for groups that are going to get something out of doing arts, art creative work. So um, like populations that don't like, like immigrant populations who um, maybe the, the people who are, 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 um, you know, the if they're doing it here and they're not from the US, you know, maybe they can represent more with pictures um, and drawings. Um, and, you know, it's like a sense of um, accomplishment. You've made this beautiful work of art and it represents you and it's kind of can, can give you just a sense of, um, you know, I guess accomplishment and, and satisfaction. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering from like the OT perspective, like if this could be helpful, like we talk about interoception a lot. I don't know if this came up like while you were just like making this, but like kind of understanding like what is going on inside of your body, like what those feelings are. And if that could, like, even using like this body mapping could help with um, kind of understanding like why does my stomach hurt? Why does my arm feel like that? Or why do I feel so like anxious right now? So it was really cool to see that visual of like all the things that you love and yeah. <laughs> I also think, I mean, doing this, I learned a lot about kind of this um, way of doing things. So I think it can give people a lot of voice too. So also kind of you know, having those representations of things that they may want to talk about or they may not feel comfortable talking about. Um, I thought that was really great too, yeah. So I'm curious of the three of you that did the body mapping. Do you feel like you're creative? Are you somebody who seeks the arts or was this outside of your comfort zone? Um, and how might that translate or not to clients that either feel like they're crafty or creative or perhaps more nervous about what the outcome is because you're the the products are beautiful I can say that I am not artistic at all like at all like I mean <clears throat> I can I can see a photo I had my phone up and I was googling photos on you know interpreting what I wanted to kind of say and then when I would draw it out I was you know at the very end I was very proud of our work I was I was actually in awe of it. I stared at it a lot. I kept like referring back to like, look at what we made, you know, and it made me feel really great so that we were able to do something and put together. I think having someone facilitate the body map who is, you know, interested in art. We had Faye in our group who was interested in art um, really kind of brought that, like, you know, she kind of taught us how to do certain like painting strokes and how to blend colors. And I think that was part was really fun. Thank you so much. And this is kind of a time to stay in this room or move to a different one if you'd like. And the next one starts at 1247. So thank you everyone for joining us. I will be kicking us off and our presentation is called the biopsychosocial implications of chronic pain care. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to introduce our team. My name is Belle Bogle. My pronouns are she, hers, and I represent the School of Social Work. Um, some team members are not able to join us today, but Stephen Chang, he's an OMS2 from the College of Osteopathic Medicine. Shamim Vakori, also an OM, or excuse me, also from the College of Osteopathic Medicine, OMS1. Rosita Zinyatolova, a PA student. 
Erin Ahmed, who represents nursing. Congratulations and graduation. And our own Dakota Rogers in OT. I will also be leading us through the treatment process that we, we undertook this semester. So we had three collaborative team meetings. We had three interprofessional telehealth appointments over Zoom. And our collaborative process was included document sharing on Blackboard, email collaboration in the in, in the in-between, and we looked at telehealth via Zoom. Next slide, please. So we'd like to introduce you to our patient, Mr. John Doe. So um, we've changed our, our patient's name just to talk about uh, uh, HIPAA compliance and, and to, to share some details about him. So uh, Mr. Doe identifies as a husband, a father, a grandfather. In one of our sessions with Mr. Doe, he shared a quote that I'd like to share with you. Everything is for them, meaning his family. That really resonated for us. Um, Mr. Doe, from a medical standpoint, came to us because he has a long-standing chronic pain history. We also found out that he had a long-standing substance use disorder, specifically with alcohol. So it, it, it came to, to reason that during treatment, the recognition that his alcohol use was definitely impacting his movement, his sleep hygiene, the ability to provide for his family, and he shared with us that this was killing him. Some of the things that were important and, and started to, to come up in care was that he had a supportive partner that was actually um, in sobriety. And um, even though we were in the midst of a, a global pandemic, you know, um, very close to his neighbors, strong network of friends, adult children that lived within 30 minutes and was able to see his grandchildren. So that, that was very important. Next slide, please. So I'll be taking over this. Yes, I'm gonna kick this over to my partner. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, of course. Um, our initial impressions of care um, when we first met our patient, our team was concerned. Our patient has a very long and detailed complex medical history, including many neurological challenges that played a part into his chronic pain management, as well as a 25 year history of chronic pain um, with minimal um, relief. Uh, our team identified that, of course, pain management, uh, different techniques was the priority, as well as further uh, injury prevention. However, uh, as my colleague Bell said, uh, substance abuse disorder really became a big factor with our patient, and we realized that we were going to have to uh, undertake some new creative work on how to um, open up with our patient and investigate this some more. Um, and it was definitely a secondary factor and a huge part with his treatment. Next slide, please. The execution of care. Um, during our second meeting with our patient and during our debrief afterwards, um, it became very evident to us that the substance abuse disorder um, was going to now take the priority um, and would actually not really be a secondary factor, but plays very well hand in hand with the uh, chronic pain our patient was suffering from. We needed to begin addressing the pain symptomology of other, our patient um, and begin to really focus on these mental health concerns um, that we had. Um, namely was the, um, the need to abstain from alcohol um, in order to pr uh, prescribe buprenorphine um, as a pain management medication. Next slide, please. And um, bringing back the biopsychosocial, we're returning to the basics here. Um, while initially concerned with the biological factors of our patient in terms to his, in relating to his chronic pain, it became evident that this um, was now a big uh, psychological and social issue um, and that we really needed to focus on holistic care in order to um, make sure that we encompass all dimensions of proper patient care and health influence in patient well-being. Now we wanted to discuss from our own perspectives our initial impressions and how that changed through time. Um, I'm also just going to be cognizant we have about a minute left. Team. <laughs> so I know that initially we, I was concerned primarily with the pain and from an occupational therapy standpoint and from his physiological 
physical symptomatology of pain, and he was already using so many different methods to alleviate that pain that it became evident for our second appointment how important that mental health aspect was. I'll pop it to a colleague. I'll quickly just say um, my big takeaway from this experience um, coming from nursing. Um, I, I personally believe that a nurse plays a little bit um, of every role in the healthcare team. And my big takeaway from this was how important it was to uh, include the interprofessional care team with our patient in order to make sure that they get the best care possible from all members of a healthcare team. Yes, I'll definitely piggyback on what my teammates have said. Um, you know, studies are showing that issues around mental health may seem to be the most common pre-existing conditions that we're going to see as, as healthcare providers. So as I think back to our patient who came to us with really complex chronic pain and a surfacing trauma history around a substance use disorder, it really only strengthened the need for inter interdisciplinary training like this experience. And I, I don't want to speak for the team members that aren't here, but um, it, that was helpful for us. So we we're just really thankful for this experience. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for listening. And now we have a minute for questions and any transition. Well, it's been very wonderful working with this team. <laughs> it was a great experience. Dakota, this is Frank Brooks. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to hear from team members on how they think telehealth improved or um, made harder communication with, with the patient. That's oh. a great question, Frank. In yeah. our case, uh, we believe that telehealth was a great benefit, um, particularly in our second meeting, our patient's significant other was able to join us on the call and offered some great insight um, into the patient's home life. And I believe we personally believe that it helped our patient open up a bit more to us with her with them present. I'll pay you back on what my my colleague said. Um, and it was so great to see from a, a nursing and an OT because at least in school of social work, you know, we're not always exposed to all of those factors from the micro meso, um, well, from micro meso macro, but when we were in the home and, you know, I, I take that responsibility very, you know, that's a huge honor and a privilege, but not only meeting the patient's significant other and hearing their stories, but being in their home because telehealth, health, telehealth, excuse me, is being in someone's home. And so, you know, them sharing that they're building a home, them sharing, you know, where their dog walks and scratches the steps, them sharing all the noises in their yard and where the bird feeder is. That's an intimacy that we're not getting um, in the hospital. And so um, that we're all, you know, my dog was barking in one of the appointments and there, there is a relationship building strategy that telehealth um, gives us access to. And so I think that was a huge part of that. Yeah. Thank you all. My name is Bonnie Simpson, and I will be reading a brief overview of the COVID pain. pain is a serious Because the patient on pain is insufficient, which leads to inadequate pain care from postgraduate healthcare conditions. The Mercy Pain Center, under the direction of Dr. Stephen Hall, has worked with uni students for a number of years to provide an interprofessional student training experience. My name is Jordan Simpson, and I will be reading a brief overview of our poster. Chronic pain is a serious health problem growing in prevalence with an immense financial and social cost. Current medical education on pain is insufficient, which leads to inadequate pain care from postgraduate healthcare clinicians. The Mercy Pain Center, under the direction of Dr. Stephen Hall, has worked with uni students for a number of years to provide an interprofessional student training experience with chronic pain patients to meet these issues. In learning about interprofessional teamwork during the COVID-19 pandemic, we discovered that this approach allows for diverse experience and skills to be present at the table and allows for more holistic approaches and appointments and care. It places an emphasis on providing patient-centered care. By listening to different perspectives during meetings, we gained a greater understanding of each other's disciplines, and we were able to support one another as needed when unable to attend patient appointments. Overall, collaboration was crucial in establishing rapport with each other, our mentors, and our patients. Zoom presented many advantages for the patients, providers, and students. Zoom allowed students to participate in the pain clinic experience who otherwise would not have been able to. It allowed for schedule flexibility. It eliminated barriers for students, such as transportation and increased commute time. Zoom allowed more options for patient appointments. More students from different majors were able to attend appointments and participate in meetings. 
safety, and privacy was established for the patient by turning off our cameras when not speaking, as well as upon request. The patient could have joined the appointment from home if she couldn't make it into the office. Zoom allowed for involvement of a loved one for comfort and support or another provider to assist in meeting barriers such as healthcare literacy, translation, and more. Zoom does present challenges in gathering accurate information and conducting a successful appointment and may include physical examination limitations, technology challenges, and challenges in comfort with Zoom with obstacles such as um, loss of human connection and authenticity, difficulty in engaging with and viewing nonverbal social behaviors, and additional distractions such as coordination of students during the appointment. By working on an interprofessional team via Zoom, students were able to provide patient-centered care in a telehealth setting. Zoom allowed students to be present at selected appointments when available and created in an environment in which collaboration and communication were essential in establishing rapport with the client. This experience was beneficial in learning how to approach pain from a multidisciplinary perspective. Thank you very much for your time and attention. We'd like to give special thanks to Dr. Hull, Dr. Sao, Kelly Fox, and Dr. Lee for their advisement and support during this project. I had a quick question. I think I can ask it faster than I can type it. Um, as a pharmacist, I use telehealth a lot in my clinic, um, and I'm curious about the idea of turning off your camera and making the patient feel more comfortable because the patient may or may not know that they can still be seen even though your camera is off. Any thoughts on that? I can take this one. Um, yeah, so we, our client knew that we were, who was in the room and we introduced ourselves at the beginning of the um, meeting. Um, but because there were so many of us in the zoom, we just turned off the camera. So she didn't have to see like all of our faces looking at her, but she was aware that we could see her. Um, and that seemed to work for her. Um, and when she did want to just talk to the doctor separately, um, we were able to like leave the zoom for her to be able to do that. This is Frank again. Um, I'd like to ask team members, um, what their number one takeaway was from this project. I mean, you've listed a lot, but just individually, what did you take away regarding interprofessional education? I can go ahead. Um, I would say um, I learned just a lot about the different perspectives that other healthcare disciplines take when managing types of pain. Um, it was really interesting to learn about like pharmacy and other disciplines I haven't been able to work with quite yet. I didn't have experience working with pain at all and um, just learning about like pain management in general, I thought uh, was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, it's been so interesting to hear the other team's experience with the pain clinic. Any surprises? Something you didn't expect? They're great questions, Frank. I'm curious about those two. I would um, probably just say the most surprising thing to me was that pain can come from like different, can manifest in different ways. Our particular patient had, I believe she had knee problems, but she ended up having pain like elsewhere in her body. And I thought that was really interesting. That was surprised me most that it didn't have to be just exactly where her knee was, like it manifested in, in other areas. Thank you so much presenter. And now we'll be moving. Our interprofessional project, we were a part of the telewellness project that assisted older adults with um, technology use. So for our research question, we had two. The first one was, how can different perspectives help assist older adults in understanding and learning telemedicine? And the second was, can utilizing motivational interviewing help encourage older adults to learn technological devices? So we were paired together with a specific older adult and our older adult was lived at 75 State Street, which is a residential program in Portland, Maine. She has never owned a tablet and she was unfamiliar with how a tablet works. And for this purpose, we are going to call her V. She is a mother of two and a grandmother of four. She is also a widow and she enjoys spending time with her family when they're in the area. 
She was quite soft-spoken and friendly. She was open to discussing various topics with us, and she was able to listen and communicate with minimal issues or challenges through the tablet as well as through the phone. So the process, the process of this project was that we were assigned um, working with V, um, our older adult participant, um, and helping her to learn how to use the tablet. Um, and we did so by talking on the phone with her at first and explaining how um, to use the search engine Google, how to open and operate Zoom, and how to open her email. Um, so over the course of seven weeks, we were able to help her um, learn all the, the different features of her tablet. Um, we talked with her for the first time over the phone and introduced ourselves and scheduled the meetings. Um, and although it did take a few weeks um, and a few calls to help her learn how to open everything on the tablet, we were eventually able to get her to understand um, how to do so, as well as how to open the features. Um, as time continued, uh, V knew how to open her tablet on her own and utilize the Google search um, for small things such as looking up flowers and we're able to help her open the Zoom application um, and speak with her via video chat. Um, the final session ended through talking with her on Zoom and learning how to use the mute, the camera, and the share screen uh, features. As the students, Megan and I would like to acknowledge and thank all of the professors and all of the uh, coordinators of this project who helped us make this so successful. Wonderful. Is there comments from our presenter? Uh, yeah, so I personally, um, I learned a lot from that, the experience I was able to um, understand. I've never done telemedicine from the provider side before. And that was a, that was a big learning lesson, um, trying to help the, uh, the individual learn how to use the tablet without being able to see what they were seeing per se, because in person is so much different than um, being on the phone or being, um, on video chat and it's it was definitely a challenge um, but uh, a gratifying one when we were able to see the accomplishments within our participant at the end of the the project um, and I and my partner is not available today um, she had a conflicting schedule so I will be representing both of us as best as I can um, so if there are any questions, I'm open to answering them. <laughs> oh, that was very interesting. Um, and just from an OT perspective, kind of what did you think that has your participant or your, sorry, client really emphasized to you after the fact of what they really appreciated? Um, I think from my perspective, I can't necessarily speak for both myself and my partner, um, but from my perspective as a social worker, I think that our participant was really um, appreciative that we were so patient with her that we um, tried to simplify terms, um, words such as keyboard um, and, camp and um, tablet sometimes were hard for her to um, kind of comprehend. So we used words such as alphabet um, and device um, to help her kind of understand better, especially with the uh, technological um, misunderstandings, I guess, that she had. Um, as we mentioned in the presentation, she'd never owned a tablet. So she wasn't aware of a majority of the um, the vocabulary that we attempted to use. And I think at the end, she was able to, she was able to feel that sense of accomplishment knowing that she did start to understand those terms. I think I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, no, that was <laughs> super important. Thank you so much. Hi, Abigail, this is Frank, the question asker. Um, 
it, wonderful presentation. And I was fascinated by what you were talking about with regard to the jargon and the language. And for this person, it was uh, really learning a whole new technology and language together. And it sounds like you and your partner uh, adapted and were able to change words and language to make it much more understandable for for her. And that's that to me, I think is a really a powerful lesson from this. Yeah, definitely. Um, we also um, we also wanted to ensure that she knew that she was learning more. Um, it was hard um, to get all of that drug and information in within the short amount of time we had. Um, but we made sure to encourage and acknowledge every, even like even the smallest accomplishment, um, whether it was um, knowing that she turned on a camera on the tablet, knowing that she understood how to use Google search bars. Um, and even if it was something that seemed straightforward, we tried to, we encouraged her knowing, giving her the, um, giving her the good jobs and the kind of the applause that she, she deserved um, for anything that she was able to do with that new tablet. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Wonderful presentations today. Is there any final last minute reflections to share? This is Dr. Chow. I just want to thank you, both of them, my uh, pain clinic teams. Um, it's really wonderful. We have run the program for five years. This is the first time we did a Zoom meeting and it worked out really nicely. And I'm sure there are a lot of advantages we're gonna um, take in the future as well, uh, even when we get back in person meetings. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a great experience. Hello, and welcome to our presentation on an interprofessional approach to telehealth. Our team name is Great Smile. Just to give you some background, Alex, an individual in their 20s, pronouns they, them, there, came to our clinic. Alex was homeless and originally came to discuss their oral and neck pain. They were also experiencing stress related to housing, pain, appearance, and inability to afford medication. Over the course of two telehealth sessions, we worked with them to address these concerns, as well as to as well as to begin working toward their express goals of becoming employed and entering into transitional housing. Our team members included individuals in occupational therapy, physical therapy, dental medicine, nursing, and pharmacy. This past year, we've learned the ins and outs of telehealth. Telehealth is a way for patients and healthcare providers to, to connect through technology. It has many benefits, however, it also has its challenges. Benefits include increased accessibility for patients to healthcare providers, as well as students like ourselves being able to attend these interprofessional events. In addition, patients don't have to worry about transportation to doctor's appointments and can see many specialists all in one visit from their own safe space. However, telehealth presents with some challenges such as difficulty reading patient body language, as well as limitations and assessments that require hands-on care. And it also requires access and knowledge to technology, by which we know a lot of individuals do not have. So motivational interviewing is a style of patient clinician interviewing that we learned and mastered during the IPTI session this past fall. So what does that look like? Interviewers make use of open-ended questions and take a non-judgmental stance, which allows for a patient and or client to feel comfortable and fully embrace themselves in the moment. Interviewers use affirming, acknowledging phrases and summarize the patient's comments. For example, they might say, so what I'm hearing is, just to make sure the patient's wants and needs are being correctly conveyed. Reflective listening is also another major component of motivational interviewing. So just some general takeaways. Uh, my name is Anna and I learned how to approach client care in a more holistic way through the lens of other disciplines. Kay found that she was able to learn new things about patient advocacy and empowerment through collaboration with an interprofessional team. Emmeline learned that patient care is best and most efficiently delivered via an interprofessional approach. And Val learned that quality patient care can be provided through a telehealth platform driven by an interprofessional team of healthcare professionals. So that is our presentation. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. So wonderful. <laughs> I had a, a quick question. Um, when you're dealing with the patient that you introduced in the very beginning, you mentioned that the patient was homeless and kind of in transition housing. What are some resources that we could use for those patients who are interested in telemedicine? Or did you find any? Maybe you're still struggling. Um, with our particular patient, they did have access to a computer um, during the sessions, um, it's, it was a computer they were borrowing. So that was actually one of the things that we had to figure out during the first session. Uh, they had their camera turned off for the first half. Um, and it wasn't until kind of the second half when Val, our, our PT, um, was doing an assessment that we had a discussion about turning that camera on. And it turned out that it was um, because Alex, the patient, um, was unfamiliar with that particular computer. Um, we didn't really discuss in depth um, how to increase access since they had consistent access to um, a computer during our sessions, but I think it's definitely an important thing to consider with telehealth. And it looks like in the chat um, that Karen said, were there specific challenges to interprofessional practice in the telehealth setting? Yeah, um, I can take that one. There were challenges, um, like Kate mentioned in the beginning, the client's camera was off and we weren't really sure if that was because they were, didn't realize it was off or if there was a specific reason. So that presented as a specific telehealth challenge. And one of our RPT who tried, to, who wanted to see the client perform like certain arm movements or, um, wasn't able to when their camera was off. So that presented as a challenge as well. Um, I have a question. Uh, having been part of this uh, team process with you all, um, which you handled beautifully, by the way, and I know I'm biased, but handled beautifully nonetheless. Um, uh, you handle, as a team, I saw you handle situations that weren't always easy, and like with the camera and all of that. But uh, how did you regroup? How did you how did you manage to handle those um, difficult situations as team members? Um, I think we did a lot of like planning ahead, kind of talking about maybe some expected challenges that would come up, and then. Um, after the fact or during breaks in our meetings with the patient, kind of reflected on what had happened, um, how to talk about some of the challenges that had come up. So in that first session, we had a break midway through. So we did discuss the, um, the camera being turned off, for example, um, kind of brainstorm some different reasons why the patient might have had the camera off, how we could approach discussing um, turning the camera on in a way that would still like protect um, the, the patient's um, autonomy, safety concerns, things like that. Um, so yeah, it really was just about taking some time to discuss things before and after every session with the patient. Mm -hmm. Great. And there's a really interesting question in the chat from Ellen. How did the client respond to the interprofessional nature of your approach? So our approach was um, Kate, who uh, represented nursing, she uh, started the conversation with the client in the beginning. So we felt that having that one go-to person that was always present in the room, in the room <laughs> with uh, the client was very important. So our approach was having Kate there at all times and then other professionals would filter in uh, once like a referral was made. But having that one go-to person who was able to summarize the end of the session, that particular session, we felt was the most important part of um, just the telehealth approach to make that client feel the most comfortable. Yeah, and when we had our um, debrief with the, the actor who played our patient, um, they did um, kind of say that that in particular made them feel comfortable and made them feel like they had that connection, helped them feel that we were working together as a team. Thank you so much. That's super wonderful to hear 
your input and your presentation. All right. Thank you, team. A uh, great smile. And now we have just a general discussion and debrief. Um, a little bit of a reminder today, we saw the biopsychosocial dimensions of chronic pain care, the benefits and challenges of telehealth from the pain clinic teams. We saw the telewellness project and if you teeny, great smile. Floor is open to any and all discussions. <laughs> I think we have some, some students here from the previous presentations. Um, Ellen had asked a question about res, um, the client's response to interprofessional nature of the approach for telehealth um, and telemedicine. And we only got to ask the last group, but if anyone else wants to add their thoughts, I just think it's really interesting. We've talked a lot about our barriers and our perceived barriers of what the client or the participant or the patient has to has, but has, did any of you get lucky enough to have a client or a patient or a participant tell you exactly how they felt about the interprofessional nature of your telemedicine? On a final feedback form for the pain clinic, we did have some positive feedback from our client who had just mentioned that he enjoyed seeing so many different professionals or students in one and that it was very helpful for the breadth of the students. And I definitely think as a student myself, it was super helpful for me as an OT student to really learn from other disciplines and be there to have that communication with and even if it's just that modeling that you don't necessarily cognitively realize you're doing. Any other thoughts before I move on? We have another good question coming up. Um, so Ellen asks as well, what do you think is the future of telecollaboration as we inch closer to a post pandemic world? Um, I think where I had seen it before uh, COVID and where I think it'll probably continue to develop. Um, for me, I, I come from Oregon and the Eastern two thirds of the state is incredibly remote and has very limited um, access to healthcare and especially specialized care. Um, and so telehealth and these sort of telehealth clinics have um, started popping up where individuals can either use their own technology or go into you know, like a community center that might have a couple of cameras with video capability. And so individuals are able to meet with um, specialists and, and become familiar with a, an interprofessional team without having to make the eight hour trek to Portland every time. Um, so then when they do make that trek, um, their collaborative team has had more time to um, really figure out like targeted approaches to maximize the efficiency of their time when they're in the city. And I think Karen asked a really like a nice segue question because I think you touch upon some of that, Kate, but um, for anyone in the room, um, I'm curious about the challenges specific to working in interprofessional teams in the telehealth setting. So in some, when we're in our training, we often have the ex extra time to be able to do these collaborations. But in uh, the non-training setting, we may find that all of our all of our uh, schedules don't quite overlap so nicely. So um, what kind of challenges did you, did you experience and any thoughts? I guess I'm gonna add to Karen's question. Any thoughts about how we might be able to manage some of these challenges? I guess what I would have to say about this is that um, you know, you made a great point. It's definitely going to be our schedules are very hard. It would not, there are obviously going to be times where we all would not be able to meet together. However, I feel like the, the, the comeback to that would be that since this is a telehealth setting, you know, the patient wouldn't be as inconvenienced if they had to drive, you know, like I had to come for an hour to see this provider. And then the next day I have to drive again at the hour back to the office to see now this provider versus, you know, versus telehealth, you know, they're gonna be, oh, well, I don't have to drive an hour each way. Now I can just, <coughs> sorry, I can just do the, the meeting on Wednesday and do the meeting on Friday, uh, Friday or Thursday with the patient at home. And it's not, they won't be as inconvenienced. I think that's the, the trade-off to that. Yeah, I completely agree. Even just scheduling as students, our schedules often didn't overlap, but the telehealth and Zoom platform definitely mitigated that a bit. I have to say what was so striking about a lot of these, um, these uh, the work that you guys did um, is that you were able to kind of meet in the same room often at the same time. Um, 
So sometimes you had like a, a go-to person and then they would kind of, you'd add people as you go and as you need. And that's really interesting. And I, I like to think I work in an interprofessional environment and I think I do, but sometimes what happens is, you know, the pharmacist, which is myself, I see the patient and the doctor sees the patient and then um, the nurse sees the patient and then the nutritionist sees the patient, for example. But we never get to see them in the same room. And I think that that's what telehealth really offers the opportunity, even if we could just put a couple of those professionals in the same room at the same time, that's going to offer so much more. And I think there, there is opportunities there. And if we um, think if we move toward, towards a model where there's less, you know, we see a patient every seven minutes um, and we get to see our patients for a little bit longer, this will also be an opportunity. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point to think about how um, we can both like use telehealth as a tool, but also learn from telehealth um, and what it offers to interprofessional collaboration or how that could influence in, in person collaboration. Um, I think one example that really jumps out to me in the hospital setting anyway is um, how closely PT and OT uh, collaborate. I mean, to the extent that um, many, many people kind of conflate their roles. I uh, was just wondering like how uh, other professionals can, can learn from them and can learn from um, inter and can telehealth collaboration to increase collaboration in person. It's certainly obvious to me that you've all learned a lot about telehealth and the, the um, advantages and some of the disadvantages. Yeah, you've all thought a lot about it too. You've, you've uh, provided a lot of insightful points. I think that, you know, some of them seem, you know, okay, yep, there's some basic barriers, but you guys thought really deeply about them. And I'm glad you got the opportunity to open up and, and let us know what you think. I also remember that the, your presentations, your PowerPoints, all those things, it's a documentation of this incredible era that we just lived through. And you all are have lived through it, uh, often the first um, classes. And so keep those documents. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Now there'll be closing remarks in the main session. Thanks, Dakota. Thanks, Sydney. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you, too. Hello, my name is Casey Keyes. I'm a second year comm student with a background as a paramedic in Minneapolis. After the death of George Floyd this summer, I was inspired to fly out to the city and volunteer as a street medic alongside the protests. During my time as a street medic, I saw that a lot of my other protesters had no formal medical education. Upon returning to campus in the fall, I was inspired to reach out to CECE and other allied health professionals to try to put together an event that would allow them and inspire them to use their experience to contribute towards times of civil unrest. As a comm student too, I feel like I don't get a chance to interact with the other allied health professions. And this gave me, despite COVID, a chance to interact and collaboratively work together on a project with a number of allied health professionals. Hi, I'm Bethany. I'm a second year occupational therapy student with EMT experience in New York and Pennsylvania. Casey did a great job of gathering a whole group of allied health professionals to work with, which was really empowering as somebody coming from an EMT background into this um, group with lots of different uh, allied professionals to work with, with, with that same shared background. As the, an occupational therapy student on this team, I really focused on preparing as to be a medic and what that would look like, as well as the mental health component of providing aid within this context. The other piece is that during the entirety of this project, I was in Portland, Oregon, completing my second level two field work opportunity, which um, impacted when we could and could not meet. I'm Chris Eidson. I'm a first year doctor of physical therapy student. I was recruited by Casey and CECE to bring my unique perspective as both an EMT and a combat veteran to this event. Uh, along with that, as a physical therapy student, I really wanted to focus on bringing the perspective of trauma-informed care as it relates to protest medicine. I am Wyatt Blackstone. I'm an undergraduate here at UNE, and I was recruited by Casey and CECE uh, based off of my experience being an EMT for three years doing 911 transport as well as a fire line EMT, providing my experiences with environmental hazards as well as triage to this event. Um, I was also able to bring in a lot of the undergraduate community as well as the undergraduate EMS community to this graduate level event, and I'm very happy how this event went providing education resources to the community inside and outside of the classroom during this, e this event and well after.
Hello, my name is Casey Keys. I'm All righty, and at this time, if anyone has any questions for the team that presented, please feel free to ask. Or if the team would like to elaborate at all, we do have until um, 1218 to discuss your poster presentation. I'm, I'm gonna unmute rather than be in the chat and I'd love to hear more about the trauma-informed perspective that you brought into this presentation because there's no doubt, first of all, Amazing presentation, just want to say that on, on all levels. Um, but I'm curious about how you infuse trauma-informed practice and trauma-informed uh, uh, skills into the work that you did. I think, I mean, Shelly, this is something we talked about uh, after the event, but that's a, a facet that we could have like done a much better, I mean, better, but like we could have explored that deeper. I think um, a lot of the presentation focused on like the nuts and bolts and the poster was kind of like the collaboration between us interprofessionally, but that is something that's like, extremely relevant um, for like the, you know, post-event de-escalation, debrief, like how to hopefully like incorporate your experience into like a meaningful like narrative moving forward. Um, so I think just like reflection on that, like taking time for self-care like in between because uh as my time in Minneapolis this last summer taught me like engaging in protests like day after day is exhausting like physically mentally emotionally i'm not i mean to to our credit a little bit casey that that was something that we did talk about <laughs> like in this like when we were initially planning and like when we were discussing what each of the interprofessional roles would have um, I also think, do you have top three things you'd want someone to know about protest medicine? Um, yeah, I would say first thing, anyone can get out there and do it. Uh, get a tourniquet and uh, some Narcan and a bag of Band-Aids and some sunscreen and you're good to go. Uh, I mean, that's like grossly reductionist, obviously, but uh, I think that's like the top thing is like feel empowered to engage however you want to engage. And the second thing, like right off that is like, there is no like cookie cutter formula for how you want to do that. I think the... This the inspiration for this came from like seeing all the, the protests that were happening and knowing that I had experience feeling powerless and frustrated and wanting to like engage with the protests in like a meaningful capacity. And that looks different for everyone who chooses to engage with them. Um, but I think it's just because you can be aware of like that full spectrum of how to do it. Uh, then I think that's that's what this was trying to encourage you is like these are the information we presented was a variety of avenues you could explore things you could engage or like dig deeper in. Um, and that being said, like take or leave whatever works for you. And I don't know how to, the third is, um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't think of anything snappy off the top of my head. I think, I think the third for me would be don't become a victim yourself. Like there is some mm -hmm. level of like under, <laughs> like, like, yes, you can engage what you want, but like know your scope of practice and know the area, like do your homework beforehand so that you don't put yourself in a position of like danger. Yeah, and before, like, we're, I know we're running low on time, but the last question, this is different than a typical EMS role because typical EMS role, you have like a, a, a much more like, you have protocols, you have ambulances, you have operations and comms, like this is a much more like ad hoc, uh, you have to like kind of operate by the seat of your pants. There's no formal communication. A lot of times like phones and typical things like that don't, don't work. Uh, just due to the number of people there. So uh, it's much more an exercise in adaptability than it is, um, you know, following standards of protocol as can be, like the difference between like protest medicine and like formal EMS work. All right, thank you so much. And just a reminder, we do have time at the end to, for additional discussion if you have additional questions. Pandemic Plan Wellness on Wheels addresses the racial and um, ethnic discrepancy in accessing medical care um, during the COVID pandemic and provides some solutions. So um, in Maryland, it was found that Black Marylanders um, had suicide rates double and, and white Marylanders, um, they decreased by nearly half. And loss of employment unequally hit uh, Hispanic and Black communities. COVID deaths um, and COVID vaccinations um, do not align by zip code. To care requires transportation, convenience of location, um, uh, having child care. Many individuals delayed seeking care, including uh, urgent care for fear of exposure to the virus in hospitals and medical offices. 
Structure of barriers to accessing medical care already existed in Black communities um, who were more likely to be uninsured, not have a primary care doctor, and live in an underserved area. A report by New York City's controller showed that 75% of frontline workers in the city are, are people of color. Occupational hazards that are compounded by the fact that only 55% of essential workers in the food service industry have access to paid sick leave. Um, disproportionate burden of chronic medical conditions in, is compounded by lower access to medical health care. Um, among some racial and ethnic minority groups, uninsured rates among non-elderly Americans are significantly higher for Native Americans, Hispanic, and African Americans compared with whites. Um, they tend to live in areas where medical care is of poor quality or is underserved. Therefore, racial and ethnic minorities may receive lower quality of care for COVID-19. So I found that um, higher uh, median income household counties, so Cumberland County with 75,000, um, and the highest vaccinations, whereas Washington County had the lowest. First solution to this is wellness on wheels. Um, so getting fleets uh, of medical vans and buses to access directly um, and provide medical care to underserved rural and urban communities um, as needed. We would deliver PPE and care packages. Um, we would provide testings. We would address the disparity of access and transportation to help. Uh, we would also provide uh, pantry bundle delivery services, ready-made meal bags for the homeless, um, and again, transportation of community volunteers, child care, mental health staff, and social services utilizing local volunteers. Um, this will give us um, kind of informed care and a representative that was trusted by the local community. And our mental health focus would allow for us to apply the same model, um, establishing a sense of unity and togetherness. Um, and the incredible amount of debt um, occurred by the uh, United States shows that, you know, this is something worth um, raising all right, and at this time, if the team would like to expand at all, or if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Well, I'm going to just do it again, and and because <laughs> that was a phenomenal presentation, very powerful, very relevant, and um, I'm I'm curious about you know your those of you who um, put this together, this presentation together, this idea of uh, of. Mm -hmm you know, mobility and going into communities rather than communities coming to establish centers. I'm really curious where that idea came from. Um, and also the interplay of rurality here, which, you know, is really important. I'm sorry, that was my dog snoring. I apologize. So I'd love to hear from um, the presenters. Um, so how we got started um, was basically we listed everything we thought went wrong um, with the coronavirus pandemic response. Um, and then we tried our best to kind of find um, common determinants. And a lot of that was lack of access to care um, because either, again, people just did not want, did not feel safe to reach out to, um, you know, healthcare access points. Um, we wanted to decrease the amount of contact they had. So, you know, obtaining groceries, obtaining PPE, um, competing with each other for this PPE. Um, so we really set like individuals against each other. And, um, you know, it was very isolating for people to try to stay in um, and not get, you know, anything that they needed. Um, so that's where it came from. I'm, I welcome any of my teammates to add to that. I have a question. I'm wondering if you had to navigate or negotiate uh, roles and responsibilities as you thought through that. Um, do you mean specifically between um, like state and federal or the like the medical staff itself? The staff that the actualizing your idea. Yeah, um, so I think that's where kind of the division um, between like medical fleets and the social support fleets would come in. Um, so medical fleets, that's kind of already an established um, responsibility hierarchy kind of thing. Um, so you would have kind of medical professionals, nurses, um, and then for the social aspects, we would want social workers, um, you know, psychiatric care where needed um, and child care. Um, so th that's where it would kind of need a little more work. It also looks like there's a question in the um, chat from Casey 
saying, did you draw any inspiration off of any previous projects or initiatives? If so, um, what were the unexpected successes and pitfalls? So we actually did not. Um, it was really funny because after our initial meeting, um, I saw on, like after we had already come up with this plan um, on my Instagram, I saw that uh, New York City did like vaccine buses and I was like, well, it must be on the right track. <laughs> so no, I did not um, see any other ideas similar to that. And it would have been smart to incorporate any successes or failures. One thing we liked was um, we looked online about other um, resources we could get with vans and we saw the van concerts through the vans, which we thought was really great for adding the social component because um, it's kind of like a moving stage and it's really good for social distancing. You can kind of make, um, you could have exercise classes, um, uh, concerts, uh, talent show type things. So some things that people can look forward to in the community. It can be kind of an event that people can look forward to and um, bring the community together because we really want to incorporate this kind of um, the community building aspect as well, not just kind of treating the medical aspect, but really um, helping the mental and emotional health of the communities as well. All right, thank you so much. And again, we will have additional time at the end for any other questions or thoughts. Thank you, um, Wellness on Wheels. And if you would like to switch any between breakout rooms, now would be the time to do so. And here is just another little IPE reflection that we have, and we will move on to the next team. Hello, thank you for taking the time to read our interprofessional approach to a pandemic plan. In this voiceover, I'll be quickly reviewing the topics we present in this poster. In pre-pandemic times, we put a focus into PPE cycling to ensure several months of supply, financial buffering for healthcare firms and state budgets, identifying alternate roles that staff can fill and training them for rapid redeployment, as well as contracting doctors outside of a hospital's own system to be used as reserves. With regards to disease surveillance, Maine immigrants do not have access to Maine care, which may cause a blind spot through their inability to receive care. Support for Bill LD718 can resolve this issue. Also, we believe that international cooperation should be pushed for as a change in culture that sees it as immune to diplomatic tensions. With regard to containment and mitigation, the primary concern will be initial containment and identification of the pathogen. Structural health care system issues in the United States prevented an immediate and efficient response. Prevention can be supported with overall cleanliness of public places and businesses, reduction in number of live markets, and decreased antibiotic use in farm animals to reduce the spread of infection. Overall, an increase in communication between hospitals and governments will help with current and future infections. We must consider form of government and cultural orientation when assessing successful pandemic responses because this impacts how much control countries are able to have over their citizens and how many individual liberties people are willing to give up. Vietnam was an example of an extremely successful Eastern country. They were successful through implementing travel restrictions, closing their border to China, implementing strategic health checks, contact tracing, and a two-week stay in quarantine centers, in addition to closing schools and doing this all very early on in the pandemic. New Zealand was an example of an extremely successful Western country. They were able to do this through excellent communication between government and people, and by striving to find, test, isolate, and care for every case of COVID-19 in their country. With regard to vaccine equity, we focus on fair distribution and making sure that everyone has an opportunity to receive the vaccine. Governments can help to ensure ample supply through tax cuts or direct funding for biotech companies. We also look into different ways of engaging community leaders to help get vaccine to underserved and minority communities. Lastly, we look into open communication and how trust in the government and scientific community can lead to greater rates of vaccination. Each discipline must work together to be successful in any plan. Public health professionals are required for multiple parts, from disease surveillance to policy creation. Most importantly though, they are a good point of communication for the public. Community leaders can also be utilized as liaisons to providers. Ultimately, communication is key. If you have any questions or would like more information about our plan, please email me at bpaststory at une.edu. Thank you. All right, and if there are any additional questions or comments about the presentation, now is the time. I have a question. Um, what part of your plan did you find most challenging to try to tackle? And, and, and then also, 
two part question. Um, how did being interprofessional help you guys tackle that? For me personally, I think seeing the amount of miscommunication that really went into like COVID-19 uh, COVID with our government and how we can try and change that for the better really like it was difficult for me to like grasp because it, it seems very simple to just present information um, that is correct but then then it can be twisted and not actually followed so trying to figure out how to reduce that is very difficult in my opinion and then also looking um so i was in the containment mitigation part and looking at like things like deforestation and um uh animal markets and stuff uh and, and the antibiotic usage in the uh, united states and how much we need to reduce the our like handling of animals when we're um, sending them out to be um used for consumption and whatnot you know is a big product of you know um, spreading of infection so trying to figure out what to do with that also um was also difficult i thought too because that's something that I personally can't do, but it's something that we should try and like look into and fix. Um, so if my teammates wanna elaborate as well. Yeah, um, I think also being interprofessional really helped us to have a good perspective. We had Ben from pharmacy, which is kind of fun to hear his thoughts on vaccine distribution. And then um, Chandler's PT and the rest of us are from the comm program. Um, I also saw Dr. Timmy's question um, about conflict of thought or strategy between leadership. And we elaborated this about this a little bit more in our full presentation, but um, I looked into successful pandemic responses. And one reason like New Zealand in particular was so successful was that they were able to come up with this really centralized plan um, and provide this like frontal leadership and ex like execute this. So um, I think that that's really important for a uh, like successful pandemic response is coming up with a centralized plan and being able to like exercise like execute that as like one group. Yeah, kind of to backpack off of what Savannah had said, I looked into some research that showed that um, kind of trust in one central government led to higher vaccination rates. So it really just depends on like the culture and how much people trust their government or like the leaders. I was thinking about the relationship between the wellness on wheels and this presentation in terms of thinking about race and ethnicity and um, more vulnerable populations and the engaging various leadership in promotion. And I'm just curious whether that was factored in as you pulled this presentation together. And I see we only have one minute for that very complicated answer, but I, I just saw a nice relationship between those two presentations. Um, we yeah. primarily okay. um, looked into how we could reach out to more um, underserved communities through uh, community health workers. And we did this through um, looking at the roles and responsibilities that we generally see with community health workers. And we've seen a lot of um, people step up to the plate in um, international settings. And I think that if we were to utilize that as a, in, um, that role and like have more of a program to train more people to be community health workers, we could um, reinstate some trust in um, healthcare and um, medicine and science in general that may have um, gone by the wayside in the past due to um, um, past events such as the Tuskegee trial. Thank you. All right, thank you team two. And at this time, um, if you'd like to switch between breakout rooms, please do so. Um, and a reminder that we do have additional time for questions at the end. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Callagy. I'm a first year medical student uh, with the College of Osteopathic Medicine. The title of our project is Hindsight is 2020, Plan, Perform, Evaluate. Um, so this is a quote from Dr. Shaw. Uh, behind every single one of these numbers of cases is a person. Every one of these cases represents someone's friend, spouse, mother, child, neighbor. So we continue to ask that we treat them with the humanity they deserve. Um, and here's a summary of our project. So basically, we developed a multidisciplinary plan that kind of analyzes um, 
best practices and kind of failed performance indicators um, across four different areas, education, public health, infrastructure, and mental health, which kind of ties all these things together. Um, and so we use uh, research to show what measures should have been taken um, to prevent uh, the fallout um, if such a significant catastrophe might occur again. Hi, my name is Will Rinaldi. I'm a first year uh, student at College of Osteopathic Medicine here at UNE. Throughout this presentation, we discussed three potential plans that are geared towards education that can be utilized in case we ever need to encounter another pandemic. Um, or in case we ever encounter another pandemic or natural disaster, like the one we just experienced, the hybrid model uh, is the best way to assure that we keep schools open for students that need access to vital biological resources, a safe and productive learning environment, and the necessary tools to ensure for maximal learning experience. Specifically for urban schools, one future direction may be to develop and maintain partnerships with community organizations to prevent food insecurities during the school closures due to pandemics or natural disasters. And then the cohort model, which is a part online, part in person plan that will promote integrative and efficient learning for all students, regardless of their social backgrounds. My name is Katie Santinello, and I'm a first year in the College of Osteopathic Medicine. I have my Master's of Public Health and Epidemiology. So I came up with three public health recommendations for our pandemic playbook, the first of which is grassroots organizations and investment in them is necessary in order to garner community engagement. Decentralization of recommendations is the key in order to effectively communicate with many diverse communities. Secondly, accurate and timely information sharing that impacts the health of the population must be mandated by global entities. And finally, best practices and globally shared protocol must be available on an easily accessible platform in order to decrease morbidity and mortality regarding research, treatment, and or immunization. Hi everyone, my name is Michaela. I'm a third year doctor of pharmacy candidate. Um, my role here is to discuss infrastructure, which includes the government and our economy. Um, my recommendation is as follows. In order to maintain public health while preserving the economy, our government must provide aligned early public health messaging from public health officials and government officials, create a strong, sufficient unemployment plan with incentives for businesses to stay open, offer support for businesses converting to telework the requirement of adequate safety measures for employees who must physically attend work, and finally to offer child care support for parents who are working to keep employees in their roles. Hi everyone, my name is Belle Bogle and I'm a first year in the Masters of Social Work program. My pronouns are she, her, hers. These are the recommendations for mental health. Studies show that mental illness may soon be the most common pre-existing condition. We must continue to train the next generation of healthcare providers in an interprofessional manner to provide the best client-centered care. Our next recommendation as a team is to integrate mental health into the preparedness and response plans for public health emergencies from the onset. And lastly, we recommend that get, we should gather more data and conduct research on at-risk populations across all disciplines. We recommend census level data, insurance level data, social service provision data, and the specific pain points that we looked at are access, usage, and stigma. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to open the floor for any questions. Um, I really liked the um, integration of mental health into this concept because I think so many people think about process exclusively when it comes to planning for um, this. And I see mental health on both sides, both providers and the, the patient client level. I'm wondering like, what was the scope of mental health that you envision or what areas do you think you would prioritize as part of that? Hi, Dr. D. Thank you so for such a thoughtful question. It's really good to see you. Um, so we talked about mental health as underpinning all four of these silos, and I have to confess, we only had 30 minutes, right, for our original pandemic plan competition, and we only had three minutes, and I can't confess to you how many times we took the star in video, um, so the outtakes are really funny if anyone ever needs a chuckle late at night, but um, mental health on the, the way that we train the future of healthcare providers from, you know, studying for boards, from the way that we're all in exam periods, from how we'll be in residency and clinical rotation, that's super important, but how we come off of the role. And I even remember the first time we all met, it was six days after the shooting, the spa shootings in Atlanta. And even the way I introduced myself to my team, I gave my pronouns. I, I identified myself as AAPI, which is Asian American Pacific Islander. And the reason that I said what I said is because if we are in a rotation 
and we are not sharing part of ourselves as the identity wheel, how are we going to show up in a community pharmacy, in the ED, in um, a social service agency for our clients? And so to answer your question, and I'll, I'll popcorn it to my team, it's we are whole people treating whole people. And so as, as a higher ed institution, how are we bringing into the classroom real examples like this IPE to remind ourselves and our students that um, when we go out into the real world, that's what we're doing. Yeah, and I'll add, um, I'm Katie from College of Osteopathic Medicine. Thank you, Dr. Dorn Blazer for your question. Um, again, it, it very much aligns with the osteopathic mentality, right? Treatment of the mind, body, and spirit. Um, spirit, excuse me, um, just exactly what Bell said, whole people treating whole people. Um, so I just wanted to add that it's it's very osteopathically minded um, and just to make sure you're aware of who you are and what you come to the table with um, so that your patients can be feel feel confident in telling you what they need to tell you. Hi everybody, I have a quick question. Um, this is uh, Jen, I'm from Com as well. And um, this is very impressive. I think it's really comprehensive um, although basic, I, I'm not familiar with the, um, the context for you creating this. So I'm curious about that and, and how you might be able to share it as a model um, that, that folks could consider in the future. So we um, got involved with this project through the pandemic plan um, competition that was run by the Infectious Disease Association, which is an interprofessional um, organization on campus. Um, however, it's like run generally by uh, student pharmacists, including um, Andrew, who's the president. Um, so we got involved and we all came together as a team through that uh, competition. But then we sort of recognized uh, that there wasn't a great amount of guidance of, for what to do during our current pandemic. And our idea to make this playbook sort of came from all of us coming from different backgrounds, uh, making different recommendations to make it really concise and clear for future health professionals to be able to read it um, and take it, you know, and like take away that initial work from um, getting started with the future pandemic. Yeah, kind of going off what Michaela said too, I think uh, when we first started this, there were so many different aspects we could have took with this presentation. Uh, we had to cut out a couple categories such as, uh, you know, more politics and economics. We actually had a combined government and infrastructure. Um, so I think, you know, it could have been taken um, and more focused and more towards a bunch of different paths, but I think narrowing it down to those four that we kind of addressed during the presentation but was a challenge in itself and one that I think that we kind of executed very well. Um, but yeah, you know, it was, it was great and it's, it was really nice to see how the interprofessional aspect of this whole project um, really uh, highlighted each of our uh, respective disciplines being pharmacy, social work, uh, and osteopathic medicine. Thank you. That was very helpful. Alrighty, at this time, I will share my screen one final time. Here is our last IPE um, reflection from an alumni, and it says the effective communication with other disciplines allows for better decision making for all of us as professionals for the patient's care. And for the rest of the time we have together, um, we can have an open discussion about all of the presentations seen today. Um, as a reminder, we have the protest medicine um, presentation and all three pandemic plan um, competition presentations. So I'd like to follow up with Dr. from Dr. Dornblazer. She stole my thunder there with the question about mental health, but it, this is a, a, a sort of a selfish question. Um, I've been talking a lot with uh, primary care providers and other health providers out in the field about the um, insufficiencies of integrating behavioral health and primary care that we don't quite seem to have it down yet. And so um, one of the things we've been thinking a lot about is, and I'm asking really for your advice is how do we do a better job of integrating behavioral health concept, mental health concepts into all of our health professions? That's number one. And the second part of that is um, how do we deliver it? Should it be dis discipline specific? Should it be interprofessionally? Or should it be both? Um, should we be looking at ways to um, make it seamless within the curriculum and not an add-on? So that's a big question, but 
I think every single one of the presentations touched on um, the need to integrate this, this knowledge. Shelley, what a wonderful question. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to start with one example and then I'll, I'll popcorn it. Um, I want to be cognizant. Uh, something that I read about just this morning that the team is that CVS is doing a, a pilot study and they are hiring LCSW, so licensed clinical social workers, to, to work in the clinic. And what is interesting is um, they are partnering with pharmacists. And I sent it to Dr. D because I thought this would be a great, something that I'm always thinking about. So I read something and now what can I do with it, right? And so I work for the university and I'm a student for, at the university. And we had this incredible opportunity with IPE here that frankly, I know a lot of folks don't take enough of an opportunity. It, we're already doing a thousand things, especially in, in a pandemic. And so what the article touches upon is that maybe you are um, Susie Smith and you go to CVS to buy milk and you're also picking up your prescription, but you see some literature or you're talking to your pharmacist and you say, it's been a really rough couple of weeks, couple of months, and they hear something because they interact with you and they say, did you know that we have an LCSW here? It's really accessible and that way you don't have to go find a, a mental health provider or you don't feel comfortable talking to your PCP about that because maybe there's cultural stigma or cost or whatnot. And so you start seeing the LCSW at CBS. Maybe it's just one visit, but that takes out some access issues. And so this is a pilot that's only in three or four cities, but so that's a new way to, um, to integrate into the community. That's another delivery model, but how does that affect us here at UNE? Maybe that's something that the School of Social Work and the School of Pharmacy can develop a SimLab model so that you know, Michaela, my teammate, and Belle can partner in the future with. And then selfishly, um, our pandemic team, all five of us have already committed to potentially hitting up CC for some grant money and taking the legs of our pandemic challenge and thinking about cross publishing this in a journal. We've already talked to Dr. Tom McLaughlin about a mixed study research of just taking one silo and doing a study on where this can go. So um, thank you for to Cece for putting together an amazing team and to Sandra for executing on um, ways to encourage people to work across their silos. We're not an echo chamber. And I wonder if you could partner with the School of Dental Medicine because they already have like all the community members coming in. So yeah, that's gonna be a cool project. I love that, Bethany. And if you would love to, if you could DM me your email, I would love to talk offline about that. I'm not from this, I'm from OT and I'm graduating, but I'm sure there's so a great, that is a great suggestion. <laughs> that would love to work with you on this. So I'm thinking Dr. D and I need to have a chat about how to create a rotation, not just a simulation, but a clinical rotation at CBS. I, was thinking, I will forward you the email I sent her this morning. Yeah, Thanks. I read it though and I was like, ooh, this is so cool. Yeah, we can make, we can make really, this so happen. I'll be following them. Yeah, we can make it happen. And we have mini grant money. Just send us a proposal and it's yours. I think another thing to add, and I think Belle did an awesome job giving a, a phenomenal example of that, but I think our students are a generation that's mandating and advocating for our education on these topics in a way that's never been done before. So I think, you know, in College of Osteopathic Medicine, we're suggesting topics for grand rounds and we're bringing up these conversations in our clinical skills learning like how do we ask someone about their mental health you know how do we bring it up in the 15 minute visit and then if it's not something that we think we can handle who do we refer to and how do we do that so i i think us as a generation more so than ever i think is very cognizant of the mental health roles and um, the stigma that it has held previously, and we're trying to work very hard as the future generation of um, healthcare professionals to sort of figure it out first and foremost. I also would like to just briefly talk about an experience that I had on field work where um, I was in an acute care hospital, pediatric hospital, and we had no behavioral health like member on inpatient staff. They were, it was just outpatient. So we had this patient who was there for like six weeks and after like two weeks for like complex regional pain syndrome and after two weeks of like 
OT and PT pushing and being like, yes, this person needs to be up and going to the bathroom, but they're in pain and it's, there's a psych component and we need psych. We, we like finally pulled from the outpatient team and was like, look, someone's going to have to come upstairs and help us. But like, they struggled a lot with like, as a hospital, how do we, how do we change our policies and procedures and like the funding to get inpatient psych isn't there. So then it was all a mess and it's going to continue to be a mess, but at least the conversations are happening. Well, unfortunately, we've got to go. This is so sad, but meet you in the big room. Health discrepancies with limited resources. I am Kelsey Pelletier, a second year osteopathic medical student. I'm Sarah Bonica, a first year occupational therapy student. And I'm Elisa Hanif, a fourth year dental student. Our patient is Alex Simpson. She's in her mid 20s. She's a family history of substance misuse and relational losses. And at this point, she's effectively homeless and unemployed. She was referred to our clinic. For medical, our patient presented to the emergency department between our first and second visits with dehydration. As providers, we need to make sure we're asking our patients about the physiological requirements for survival. For Alex's medical challenges, she had challenges with transportation, insurance, and medications. She had a comprehensive past medical history, but her chief complaint today was her periodontal disease with vis visible decay on her front teeth. For medication, she used to take valacyclovir, but it was discontinued due to lack of access. She also takes Tums as needed, which we recommended for motorine. For social, she used alcohol and cannabis for her anxiety. Her support system is her friend, Bobby. So the patient's chief complaint was that her teeth hurt everywhere and she doesn't like the dark spots on her teeth. And she also presents with a burning feeling on the roof of her mouth that is brought on by stress. Her pain is a five out of 10 on the pain scale and it worsens with cold stimuli and it presents as a dull ache throughout the mouth. She feels embarrassed by her broken down teeth and she does not have a set oral hygiene routine. So typically when a patient presents to the emergency um, clinic for a dental visit, uh, we, tip, we follow an emergency protocol and that, that we use that to help um, draw certain key answers from Alex. Unfortunately, we can't make a definitive diagnosis without x-rays, probing depths and endo testing. However, we were able to um, ask open-ended questions to help gather more information. And we were able to connect with her on not only a provider level, but a patient personal level as well. Understanding um, that not everyone has access to correct materials, it was important for us to tailor a, a maintenance plan um, for Alex. And this was uh, fundamental to keeping her trust and improve her oral health. As Alex was very timid, OT and the interprofessional team worked through the entirety of both telehealth sessions to build a relationship with her and determine which occupations or activities were most meaningful. Meaning um, those activities were determined to be friends and animals. Her occupational goals were finding employment, finding housing and relieving her symptoms of pain. Um, the outcomes that we had in the short time with her were opportunities for housing, work and volunteer determining her intrinsic and extrinsic points of motivation, evaluating her social environment, um, providing opportunities to facilitate meaningful occupational engagement, incorporating water into her daily routine to avoid any instances of dehydration in the future. Health descriptions. All right, hi everybody. Can everybody hear me? Was everyone able to hear that okay? Okay, great. So um, that was our first IPTI team um, and we invite you all to um, drop any or speak any questions or comments you have about that presentation because we have our presenters with us here. I have a question. This is Sarah Garber from Rosal and Franklin. And my question really has to do with telehealth and how do you feel the telehealth environment affected this particular simulation? Did it go well? Was it better? Go, was it worse? I can go for that one. Um, so telehealth definitely made it challenging. Um, as a DO student, it's you want to be able to talk to your patients and see your patients and assess your patients. So one of the complaints was neck pain. 
And neck pain can be a wide variety of things. And without being able to assess my patient adequately, it was very difficult to determine if that was a cause. And what the cause was, it was it related to her mouth? Was it related to an infection? Was it some kind of trauma? Was it somatic dysfunction? So that was very difficult in that regard. Um, I think as a group that we did a very well, very good job with like being a full relationship with our patient and informing that relationship, we were able to get information out of Alex that otherwise maybe even in person wouldn't have gotten out of her. So. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add uh, to Kelsey's point that it was a great experience for me because uh, in dentistry, I think that telehealth is kind of a new thing um, that's going on, and especially when the pandemic hit, a lot of the schools started adopting that um, mode. But again, I couldn't really gather as much diagnostic information as I would have otherwise without you know, gathering x-rays and clinically examining her since this was a heavily dental case. But um, at the same time, it was great. And it kind of puts things into perspective as far as uh, the interprofessional or the interhuman, the importance of interhuman touch, you know, putting your hand on somebody's shoulder or just that human kind of way of patient provider interaction, things like that. I'll go off of what both of them have just said, because um, I agree completely with Eliza, Eliza and Kelsey, because um, it was really hard to form that relationship with her. She was a very timid individual, um, so it was hard. But also, on the other hand, we got to see things like her home environment and stuff like that, which we might not have been able to see had she come into the clinic. So that was an interesting point of view as well. That's a really, really good point. Um, how do you think it was for her? Do you think because she was so timid, it might have been easier or harder for her? I think maybe so in the first session, her camera was down on her face, but when she, we told her that it was an accident. So we didn't know. So I think that maybe made it easier for her because she didn't have to find transportation because like we said she was homeless and staying at a friend's house so I think that probably brought her down um but the actual technological aspect did get her there where she didn't even realize her camera was hard to engage that all right, I'm gonna, um, thank you so much for sharing that all. Um, you probably all saw the broadcast message. We're all about to um, go into the next presentation. So you are all welcome to stay on here or if you wanted to visit someone else on a different track, you're more than welcome to do that as well. And uh, we'll see you back here in a little bit. Thank you. We did our poster um, on our IPD experience and titled our poster, The Interprofessional Collaborative Approach to Treating and Supporting an Underserved Patient Through Telemedicine. We had Elena George, a social work student, Miriam Lacani, a dental student, Tamara Brusso, a physician assistant student, and Sarah Manuels, a pharmacy student. The patient was a 20-year-old non-binary individual who was seeking treatment for dental pain through a dental office who was then referred to a community health clinic for further physical and psychosocial evaluation. I will now talk about our interprofessional collaboration and learning points. Elena. Go ahead. Um, so Alex was greeted by the team with unconditional regard in hopes of creating a safe space for dialogue through open-ended questions. Balancing Alex's motivation to change by placing value on the importance of the issues and the confidence in changing current behaviors. As a pharmacy student, I we assessed the patient's current medications used for both OTC prescription and recreational use and supplemental use and ensure the medication's appropriateness due to current and previous indications. For dental, we assessed the patient's level of decay through open-ended questions, explained the difference between gingivitis and periodontitis, and counseled the patients to not eat sugary foods or uh, Tums before bedtime without brushing teeth. As a physician assistant, we assessed the patient's chief complaints and then provided home therapies and did the Epley maneuver over on the right um, while the patient was at home and we were on telemedicine. We'll now look at the process of motivational interviewing and the context clues that helped us treat the patient. As pharmacy, 
I picked up on the context clue of a lot of stress that revolved around the cost of the medication. So it allowed me to see that the patient was struggling with insurance coverage, which allowed me to guide the patient in how to enroll for Medicare and Medicaid. Accepting Alex's ambivalence by their visual cues of physical distancing through wearing their hood and going off camera multiple times. Developing a partnership with Alex by evoking strengths and use, and use of reflective listening skills was critical. Alex was drinking a beer during the second encounter despite their pain, Jerry upset, and vertigo, which prompted questions about alcohol and substance abuse. The patient had a lack of access to dental care, so strategies were discussed to make it easier for the patient to brush and floss twice a day or as regularly as possible. And relationships were basically discussed between sugary and acidic food at night that uh, the patient consumed. Lastly, we just wanna go ahead and thank both Dr. Danielle Candonario and Dr. Nancy Jo Ross for guiding us through the process of practicing interprofessional medicine. These tools that were provided in this process will allow us to build both professional and personal skills to allow us to be successful healthcare professionals in the future. All right, thank you, Integrated Access Allies. Um, does anyone have any questions or would anyone like to share um, or any of the team members wanna introduce themselves? I think it's just two of us here, but um, I'm Tamara, the PA student. Hi, I'm Miriam, I'm the dental student. Great. How did you guys like there? working with each other over telemedicine? How did that work? Um, I think it went really well. Oh, go ahead, Miriam. No, go ahead. <laughs> I think it went really well. Um, definitely learned a lot of things. I mean, from a PA perspective, um, I think, First of all, learning what Miriam does um, in her dental clinic, but then also what our social work and OT students uh, were doing was really, really helpful. Um, also being able to talk to our pharmacy student was just like overall uh, useful in terms of figuring out questions with like insurance. Mm -hmm. I think the experience was fantastic. Um, I think, again, it was a emphasis that uh, providing patient-centered care, uh, not just specific to your discipline, but what the patient needs and all aspects um, to provide. Um, to be able to provide that holistic care definitely requires collaboration with other profession and knowing how to do that efficiently is very important. So I'm just very grateful that we were able to have that experience to sort of practice that beforehand. Do you think it made it easier for the patient in this scenario? Um, I think it was great that the patient had, um, you know, access to people that have different strengths. Like I know that our patient in particular said that they got a lot out of um, not only having uh, like medical and dental, but the resources from the social worker and the OT student right there. Um, also, our patient didn't really know what their options were in terms of healthcare, considering they were um, homeless. And so the pharmacy student was really good, like able to have a long conversation about um, what health insurance options were available to them. I think it was also really important because since this case was very dentally involved, um, and I think the team before us talked about how there was, you know, lack of access to the current radiographs. So there was no real way for us to be able to assess, you know, um, you know, caries or things like that. But just the patient came in with, you know, such a lack of understanding that, okay, what is going on? Why is my mouth hurting? And then there are all these other things that are happening what can I do to make sense of it? Like, where do I need to start? And I think that's essentially the issue that, you know, laying down the steps for them that this is what you can do this week. Maybe this is what we're going to tackle next week. So having that plan laid out, the patient really appreciated that. And then uh, dentally speaking, having the understanding that, okay, if my gums are bleeding, what possibly could be causing that? If my cusp fractured, which, you know, any part of the tooth, what could be causing that? So earlier in the video, when we talked about, you know, um, assessing the patient's dental level of decay through open-ended questions was just to help them understand, um, you know, what's going on um, and what are some of the different diagnoses that we are considering based on what the patient presented to us with. But having that additional information, definitely the ra updated radiographs um, would have uh, helped for sure. But nonetheless, I think the patient appreciated having a plan laid, laid out for them. I do think it was very helpful since not all of us were in every encounter. Um, like I think I may have been one of the first people to notice that our patient was drinking a beer during a physical exam. And so I was able to send a chat message to uh, the pharmacy student and kind of be like, this might be a good time to ask some questions about substance abuse because uh, our patient was saying that they were in extreme pain and was nauseous, but then came to a medical appointment with a beer. 
Sorry to cut you off, um, but we, that's time. We've got to transition to our next presentation. Thank you so much for presenting. And everybody is welcome to stay on if you'd like or to go to a different track. We'll see you guys in a little bit. Hi, my name is Evelina Stanek, and I will be presenting with one of my teammates, Michaela Busak, about our entire team's experience of exploring interprofessional teamwork and patient care via telehealth. So our objective was to perform telehealth assessment through motivational interviewing and create a care plan as an interprofessional team for a patient experiencing multiple health needs and barriers um, to access. So our patient, Alex, is a Caucasian male with a past medical history of oral herpes, periodontal disease, vertigo, tinnitus, digestive symptoms, and mental health struggles. He presented to us with pain in his oral cavity and a burning sensation that has been present for a while, but worsened over time. He previously took medication for oral herpes to help with the pain, but has not been able to fill his prescription due to healthcare um, and health insurance loss and financial inability. He also had complained of other medical needs um, and symptoms, including heartburn and abdominal pain. His lack of housing and health insurance, um, as well as access to transportation has prevented him from being able to see a doctor and a dentist. Um, and his uh, inability to get access to clean water um, has also resulted in emergency department visits um, from dehydration. So our goal for the first visit was to build rapport and clarify Alex's concerns and priorities, explore and verify um, his chart history and to start a structure, um, to structure a treatment plan. And the goal for our second visit was to develop uh, more of a concrete health plan and to support Alex's strengths. Uh, we also tried to explore some ways to use his friend, uh, Bobby, a support to help Alex. Based on Alex's own reports of his priorities, we identified two major areas of need. First, his oral and dental health was an urgent need. And second, he needed to have some support in place to be able to follow through on appointments and care. Between our first and second session, Alex was able to get main care all on his own. So that was a huge hurdle that we did not have to navigate as a team. Once he had insurance, we were able to easily refer him to the UNE Oral Health Center to get his dental needs taken care of. And we also referred Alex to the Portland Community Free Clinic based in, on its proximity to Preble Street where he already went frequently to establish care with a PCP. And he was enthusiastic about both those options. His friend Bobby was also excited about providing transportation and supporting Alex to make it to his appointments. And finally, Alex stated that he would be able to think more about employment and housing once he was in less pain, as his pain was kind of dominating his life at that point. As an interprofessional team, we learned a lot through this process. Um, the telehealth environment was new to us, but was actually really beneficial as we were able to have multiple providers meet with Alex all at one time, and he was able to have pretty easy access um, to an appointment when he wouldn't have been able to necessarily get to an appointment. Uh, we learned a lot about the patient provider relationship, building rapport and really listening to Alex's story and his own priorities and needs rather than just the referral as they were fairly different. We worked a lot on our interprofessional collaboration and learned a lot about when to step up and advocate for our own profession and also when to step back and realize that what was needed was not necessarily within our own scope of practice, as well as when to refer to other um, providers. And finally, the actors that played Alex and Bobby both gave us some really excellent feedback about the way that we interacted with them and how we can improve that, that we will all be taking into our future practice. Um, finally, we just want to acknowledge our faculty mentors who were such wonderful supports, as well as our student uh, facilitator and the other member of our team who was unable to join us tonight. Uh, thank you for listening to our presentation about our interprofessional team immersion experience. All right, that was the IPD team optimistic otters. Thank you for your presentation. And we'd like to open up the floor to see if anybody has any questions for them. I have a question for you, um, as always. What did the actors pick up? What were they suggesting? Um, I think one of the big things that came out of the feedback from the actors was um, use of jargon, which 
is it something I think we all learn about in our programs, like don't use jargon with clients, but it was really helpful to hear about words that we don't necessarily think of as being jargon, um, just like medical terms. Um, this came up, up a couple times just with dentistry terms that I think like us in the healthcare profession, we were like totally comfortable with, but um, just like raised a little bit of a flag for um, our actors. And then also um, there was some feedback around just wanting to know a little bit more of what our plan was, which I think was hard because as students in the IPT program, we didn't necessarily know exactly what our plan was at that time, but um, just a little bit more communication around like, this is what we're gonna be doing today. This is what we're trying to get to, um, stuff like that. Michaela, yeah, well said, Michaela, I was just going to add to that, that um, a couple of examples of the jargon that our patient was uncomfortable with was radiograph um, and PCP. He didn't know what PCP meant. Um, so when we said, let's find you one, he said, what was that? What is that? Uh, just for everyone's reference. What was the one, maybe one thing that you really liked about doing it in a telehealth platform and one thing you really didn't like? I mean, I think in this situation, one thing that was good about it was that like one of Alex's main barriers was transportation. So knowing that we were able to see Alex because of the telehealth platform was a huge positive. Um, and for me personally, I found that the like um, figuring out the dynamics of the interpersonal, interprofessional and like interpersonal workings was more challenging via Zoom. Like we got there but it took longer than it would have to get in a flow than I think it would have if we had been in person. Thank you. What was, I maybe length of time answers this question, but what was, like if you were to do this again, how would you get in that flow differently or faster in, within the telehealth context? And maybe, maybe, maybe there's nothing you could have done. I was just curious. Um, so I think, so I think that the um, UD professional meeting is really helpful. So I think if I could get done again, we, um, so before the meeting, we're gonna be, be um, we, we, we as a group, we're gonna be, be first before, meeting the patient. So we have the plan laid out. So made the com a communication or conversation go smoothly. All right, we'll have to pause there real quick um, because we're about to transition to our next um, presentation. Thank you all so much for your presentation and for answering such really great questions as well. Um, so for those of you who are here, if you'd like to stick around for the next um, session, please join us or feel free to go to another session if you'd like. See you all in a little bit. So for our presentation, we focused on motivational interviewing to assess how medical, dental, OT, PA, and social work providers can work interprofessionally to create holistic treatment teams for patients within our community. As a student social worker, I use MI to assess and treat patients' mental health. Hi, I'm a dental student and we use MI to help improve patients' overall oral hygiene through improving brushing techniques and flossing. Hi, my name is Kelsey and I'm an OT student and we use motivational interviewing to understand what activities or tasks are important to a patient and how to change their thoughts or behavior. My name is Christy and as a PA student and as well as for physician students, uh, we can use MI for various patient complaints and to help patients reach their health goals and adhere to treatment plans. Hi, I'm a student physician. Um, motivational interviewing can be time consuming to learn to use effectively, but in the long term, it's more productive and efficient than typical methods of change with patients. Just even getting the patient to talk about change, even if they aren't ready to make changes, can be progress. So with all healthcare professionals using this approach and communicating progress with each other, huge changes can be made to a patient's health. So for our presentation, 
All right. Thank you so much for that great presentation. And um, once again, we'd like to open up the floor to see if anybody has any questions for this team. I know motiva motivational interviewing is a very fascinating topic, at least for me. Does anyone have any questions? If you have any team members present here, if you'd like to share how your experience was and what you learned about from each other's professions, uh, maybe a fun fact you learned about each other's professions during um, this um, project. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm the dental student. Um, and I really appreciated this experience because I love that we were able to work with other health professionals. And I can see how positive that can be for a patient who has several conditions. And I think if we def keep in touch with these other health professionals in different disciplines, it can really help bridge the healthcare continuum for that patient. Um, if anyone else wants to speak to that, they can. I think there's a question in the chat from Tom User. If one of you presenters are able to answer that question. Yeah, my name is Kelsey and I'm the OT student in the presentation. And I think a big component of motivational interviewing that we used a lot was empathy and just understanding our client, her name was Alex, and just understanding her situation and how she feels um, instead of trying to fix everything at first, just seeing what her concerns were and talking to her and then making decisions and going from there. I have a question. In the telehealth format, um, how was it establishing a relationship so that you could ask these open-ended questions and, and, and make your motivational interviewing technique work? I think that one thing that we tried to do was um, all introduce ourselves and make sure that uh, Alex felt comfortable um, and felt comfortable in the setting and talking to us so that she would be able to open up and answer any questions that we had. I think also, I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to that, but I felt like I was really trying to be more expressive so that she could read or the patient could read our emotions and show that we're really there for her or the patient. And um, it just felt more exaggerated because you're on a Zoom format and you don't want that person to think of or interpret it the wrong way. Are there any other presenters who would like to share about their experience or what they might have learned about um, other professions? Can I ask a question, Michelle? Absolutely. So I'm just curious. I, I might have missed this because I came in a little bit late. I got kicked off. Um, uh, I'm just curious. What was it like uh, dealing with difficult subjects um, with this patient uh, over the uh, through telehealth? Because um, I know Alex has a lot of significant issues to deal with, and I just wonder what it was like managing some of those difficult conversations um, with them. <laughs> Um, well, from what I remember, it's been a while. Um, I think regurgitating what the patient said really helps us to communicate and understand the patient better. And if that was correctly interpreted, then we could move on and in, in terms of navigating her issues and making sure she, the patient feels acknowledged too is really important. Um, if anyone else wants to speak to that, they can. I, th I think what I was asking is what was it like for you as a practitioner to have those difficult conversations? I think it was a little surprising at first, like we weren't expecting it, but once we knew that it was more difficult, we were ready to answer her questions and just to understand where she's coming from. And we got more used to it eventually. Okay, well with that, I think we'll pause here because we're about to um, segue into our last presentation. So thank you so much, Hopeful Heal Healers team for um, sharing your presentation and for answering all these great questions in this conversation. So um, stay on if you'd like, as you could see from the um, broadcast message that was just sent out, um, you can stay on or you can navigate to another room if you wish. And we'll see you back in a little bit. Thank you again so much. We are Team 6, and this is our project on technical difficulties associated with interprofessional healthcare through telehealth medicine. 
Telehealth is becoming the norm in some practices due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. It may look great on the outside by providing access to healthcare providers by the click of a button, but for many people, this is not possible due to lack of technology and stable internet connection. For those who are able to participate, there are a multitude of things that may go wrong. Hi, Wes. Thanks for coming in today. Oh, um, I think you're still muted. Yeah, there's a there should be a button in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Oh, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. Good job. Hi, Wes. So, um, so uh, oh, uh, sorry. So, so, oh, wait. Um, I'm not sure which one of you I'm supposed to be listening to. Um, go ahead, Becca. Sorry, just wanted to ask about your arm pain. I was just wondering if you could describe it a little bit for us today. Yeah, so it's kind of um, the... Um... Oh, I think he froze. Wes, are you still here with us? Can you hear us? Like it goes, shoots down through the... Oh, wait, did I, did I... Sorry, did my screen freeze? Yeah, so it yeah. was a little jumpy. All right, that happens, yeah. yeah thanks. So can you tell us a little bit about what's going on with your wrist? Yeah, I just, I'm concerned that I might have heard it again after the, just, there's somebody else in the room with you? Oh yeah, he's just looking for his shoes. They're at the front door. I'm talking to you about medical stuff. Like, is this kind of personal? I'm sorry, he just had one question. So we'll, we can continue. Okay. So is there anything that's been difficult for you to do throughout your daily, throughout your day? Um, the, well, yeah, like like washing dishes and stuff can be hard sometimes. And okay. are you getting texts? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Somebody's going through something. Just try to ignore that if you can. I mean, okay. I just thought you were like, aren't you here to be helping me? I am. I'm so sorry. There's no way to turn that off. I don't know how. What we've just seen are examples of a few of the things that can go wrong with telehealth, uh, technical issues, and other such issues that can come up. Thank you. All right, that was Client-Centered Chameleons, IPTI Team 6. Thank you so much. <laughs> we now welcome the comments and questions that people may have in the chat. That was almost painful to sit through, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> What was the big takeaway with that presentation? Would any of the team presenters like to share how it was putting that together and their thought process while they were going through it? I have a question. Sure. Okay. So um, I thought it was very creative as well. And I'm wondering if any of you have actually experienced that as a provider or as a recipient in telehealth and how it felt to you. I guess I'll speak first. Um, so I know in our interprofessional team immersion experience with our client in the first couple of rounds, I think it was a little, um, a little. Um, we needed some practice with our with our telehealth. So we did experience like talking over each other, not not quite as many as the difficulties that we showed in this video. But I guess the highlight we just wanted to show everything that could go wrong, even though we hope that none of these things may happen in everyone's telehealth experiences. I can say I, I, think, I, it's like, I think it's more in the sense like a lot of people do like talk about how great telehealth is and how great like like all the good things that can come out of it. But a lot of people kind of just oversee all the things that could possibly go wrong. So we just kind of wanted to present to everybody to be like, oh, like this could happen or like somebody could walk into the room and it's really not like a very like private area, but you need to make sure that you let your patients know that it's like, this is a private area. You are safe to talk about whatever you need to talk about and all that kind of stuff. So Marissa, what did you learn about other professions on your team? Um, well, me and Becca actually worked a lot together and she's nursing and it was kind of cool to see how much they overlap. I'm in the PA program. So it was kind of like, she would help me a little bit in this sense. And then like, we'd kind of go back and forth off of each other, but it kind of like, we were kind of parallel with each other the whole time. So it was, it was pretty cool to see how much of that overlaps. We do have some comments in the chat. Many people are saying that yes, technology is not always on your side. That is for sure. But Rebecca, how was your experience working on this project with um, what did you learn from other professions? 
I think I'll definitely agree with what Marissa was saying, like since we worked most together throughout the case, but I would say I learned the most about social work. Wes really shed a light on like all the different aspects of social work that I really didn't know at this stage of my, of my nursing. But it was really awesome to hear from him and see what he brought to the, the team experience. So if you wanted to um, give people a heads up about telehealth, you have an excellent example of all the things that could go wrong. Are there things that are beneficial about it that can that you would also talk about? and recommend? I think part of that depends on the department that you're in or the field that you're working in. Um, you know, we did have a few of those discussions as we we're kind of getting started. And um, I know for me working in social work, um, some of the, you know, because it's, it's largely conversational um, based. And so telehealth, I think, can work a lot better than it can for some of the other, uh, you know, practitioners that were in the group. Uh, so I think that there are definitely some things you can kind of plan for or prepare for. Like I have had the freezing screen thing happen um, a number of times with clients. And so I try, I try to just remember the first time I'm meeting with somebody to kind of say, you know, if I freeze or if you can't hear me, just like point to your ears, I'll see that. And, you know, we'll eventually come around. And so there's some of those things, but I do think it's very different depending on what field we're in. I'm curious to know for those of you who are watching this, how long did it take for you all to realize that this was scripted? <laughs> Because for me, I think it was halfway through and I, and I was having this panic because I was coordinating all these videos. And for me, it took me about halfway through till I realized, oh my gosh, this is all script. This is all acted. I'm, I'm with you. And at that point, I started smiling and, and really realizing how good it was. But it, it was painful the first couple of, for yeah. the first half of it. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, any closing thoughts? We have a little less than 30 seconds to go before we're all back into the main room where we welcome you to stay on for a couple extra minutes and some recognition. But if anyone has any closing thoughts, please share. I think it was great listening to everything. It was wonderful. Really good stuff. Great teamwork, it looks like. Yes, and communication too. Absolutely. So in the, in the hopes of uh, completing this in a timely fashion, we're gonna get started again. Thanks everyone. So as, you, as we all know, the pandemic brought new challenges and exacerbated any that already existed. And so today's CC presentation recognitions are to acknowledge teams that address the thorniest issues that we faced really head on. And so we're thrilled to recognize some of the outstanding presentations shared with you today with a certificate of achievement and a $25 gift card to the bookstore, which will go to each member, one to each member of the team. So for compassionate teamwork in the face of this year's daunting social and public health problems, our first recognition is for a team working with patients living with chronic pain. And I'd have happy to introduce Kelly Fox from the School of Social Work to say a few words about this team's work. So I just wanted to recognize this team for the work that they've done together. I think this was a new challenge for us working on um, telehealth and uh, they really rose to the challenge and uh, they did a fabulous job. And I love that they found the grains of what was good about working in telehealth um, as, as well as the difficulties. So um, I think they did a magnificent job and I was delighted to be a, a faculty member working with the team. All right, pain clinic team, thank you for your work. Um, so thank you, Kelly and Ling, for your mentorship also of this team. And now I'd like to introduce Karen Hussman from the Health, Wellness, and Occupational Studies program. Karen, can you say a few words about the interprofessional team who brought us the uh, ripped from the headlines CC event? Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, I'd like to say congratulations to Casey Keys, Wyatt Blackstone, Bethany Gruskin, Jos John Caswell, and Chris Eitzen. Um, this combined graduate and undergraduate amazing team all shared previous training and ex experience as um, EMS and EMT service providers. They worked together to create and present a student-led CC event in February, which was titled Protest Medicine, How to Leverage Your Role as a Provider During Civil Unrest. Um, what an insightful and timely presentation it was. 
the event outlined detailed strategies and safety precautions and has since been followed up with more workshop, workshops across campus on Narcan, Stop the Bleed, um, as well as planning for a new university-wide focus on trauma-informed care. So excellent, excellent work. Thank you, Karen. And thanks to the protest medicine team. You really, um, you planted a lot of seeds with that presentation and we're uh, thrilled to see that come from a student initiative. And uh, finally, as you know, if you've been following along this year, we believe it's important to approach difficult situations with humor whenever possible. And so we'd like to ask Mary Obi from uh, Dental Hygiene um, to tell us a little bit about your team. Congratulations, Team Six. I'm just so proud of you to bring the hilarious views of what could go wrong during technology. So thank you to Marissa, Muriel, Wesley, Jaya, and Rebecca. Um, I'm just so proud that I was part of your team. Um, they work together at the client-centered chameleons, the technical difficulties associated with interprofessional telehealth medicine. And as I watched them present, I saw everybody smile behind um, the Zoom screen. And I'm so proud of you. Congratulations. Thanks, Mary. And thanks to the, uh, to the uh, chameleons for uh, taking the chance, taking the risk and uh, hitting it out of the ballpark. So thank you all so much for attending today and uh, to the faculty for mentoring all of this complex student work. Uh, congratulations and good luck to our graduates and to everyone who has achieved the honors distinction this year. Great work under difficult circumstances. We look forward to seeing all of you who are returning in the fall back with us again. And uh, if you haven't completed the attendance survey, uh, we would love for you to do that. Give us your feedback. This was an experiment, these different breakout rooms and doing it this way. And we'd love to hear how that felt for you. And um, I'm just going to uh, put up the final slide and say uh, thank you so much. And I hope you have a really terrific day.